Hello, everyone, and welcome to Episode 6 of Nelson's Corner with your host, Mr. Nelson LeKay. Hey, Nelson. Hey. How you doing tonight? All right. All right. Also joining us as, uh, as the student. I mean, he really is the student. I really am the student, actually. Which is uh, Mr. Zach Parrish. Hey, how's it going? It's going pretty good. So you ready to really uh, grill Nelson tonight? Oh, yeah. Make sure you have a good understanding. Well, I'm really excited on? about what we're covering tonight. So, yeah, I got a lot of questions already. Right. Wow, wow. And, uh, and, and your referee, Jason Busby, that's me. And uh, with that, tonight's episode is going to be the start of a series that we really don't know how long the series will go. I mean, maybe we'll wrap it up this week with three or four videos. We don't know. But uh, it's an introduction to design patterns. And it's something that Zach has heard us talk about a lot. He's mm -hmm. heard Nelson talk about it. He's seen it talked about on the IRC, sometimes in the forums on 3D Buzz, as well as Lee and I toss it back and forth when we're working with uh, Unity content. So Zach has, on a few occasions, asked what the heck are you know design patterns. Yep. And he even mentioned it to Nelson a few episodes back when we had finished recording that it would be nice to, to talk about design patterns. So here we are. That's, that's the next thing that we're going to look at. And again, this is going to span several videos. Well, I mean, all I know about design patterns is what I've been able to glean through eavesdropping, which oh, isn't you. a whole lot, really. All right. Well, with that, I will turn it over to Nelson and, and you, Zach. Well, Nelson, where are we going to begin? Because do you want to jump right into design patterns, or is this going to be like our discussions over Link, where there's some things you want to cover first? Uh, there's some basic concepts as well as a few terms that I want to define before we get going. All right. Well, I'll let you get through those before I start barraging you with questions about design patterns. Um, so, but you know what, what, what a design pattern is, though, right? There, generally, I know what it is. I mean, from uh, all I can tell, and again, this is seriously literally comes from listening in on conversations and just kind of getting the gist of it, is it's, a, it's an approach, it's a, a method of, of tackling a specific problem, but I don't know how accurate that is. Uh, kind of, sort of. Uh, design patterns actually give you a few different things. They, the most important thing that a design pattern gives you um, is a language. And all of the de design patterns have been defined by people. Um, Eric Evans and then the uh, Gang of Four um, have defined a lot of these design patterns, and they really help in communicating with other programmers. Even if you don't use the language, the terminology of the design pattern itself in your code, you can still often look at your code, identify what pattern that it represents or what patterns it represents, and then use it to communicate effectively with another programmer. So it's kind of like a standard in that sense. Uh, kind of, yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah, it's a standard form of, of communicating different types of code. Okay. Or s pieces of similar code. It also it, it provides a lot of. I think it's really good for for you know programmers who are getting into object oriented programming because it gives them kind of something to learn about uh, a way for them to be able to use object oriented programming. You know, kind of to get a gist of what it does. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Kind yes. of to give them an example of why you, why you would use it. Um, and. And also, like, it, it helps you identify as you're writing code what sort of pattern you might be using at the moment. And you could use that in the language of your code or, you know, in the, uh, in the architecture of it. So it, it's really it's, – it's hard to define – it's easy to define what a design pattern is. It's an it's a archetype of your code. It's a pattern of your mm -hmm. code. Well, One or more classes. You can't do that. You can't say a design pattern is a type of pattern. Everybody <laughs> knows that. <laughs> So, I mean, but what I'm getting from you is that it's uh, a design pattern is a clearly defined approach to a specific type of problem in code. Yes. Okay. But they can also be used, like I said, ret retroactively in order to uh, aid in refactoring or aid in documentation or aid in communicating. You mean like kind of get done with your code and realize that it might be more efficient or easier to read or for any number of reasons go back and apply a design pattern to something you've already done? Uh, generally, it's the it's kind of different. Generally, you write your code, and then you're like, "Hey, you know, this is actually kind of like this pattern." So okay. then you you might rename a class or a method to be the name of that pattern to make it more identifiable to other programmers. Okay. So yeah, so that that's essentially what design patterns are and what they do. Um, some of the things that I wanted to cover first, though, before we really got into a few specific examples, were some basic uh, object-oriented principles, okay, like uh, classes, interfaces, inheritance, and composition, mm -hmm. as well as uh, polymorphism. And um, what do you know about OOP so far, Zach? 
only the the basics that I that I covered a long, long time ago, and uh, the idea that you can create a class, which is a, a I love trying to define the term class. It's it almost seems like a, a generic definition for a structure that you're going to expand upon later. I like yeah. telling people one word: blueprint. Blueprint. Okay, Th that that yeah. works. And. Uh, in the, the whole idea of object-oriented programming is that you define these classes which become like objects. You inherit from them. You can instantiate them. You can expand upon them. So you can say, like, this class inherits from... Okay, like, let's say you're going uh, to... What's the classic one we always use? It was a car. Mm -hmm. uh, so you define a class that is a vehicle, and a vehicle has some uh, basic fundamental properties to it. Uh, it has, be, has the ability to move through space. And then from that, you could define an automobile, which has further properties that, uh, you know, it starts off with everything that a vehicle can do. It can move through space, but a car it can, you know, it moves laterally across the ground. It has four tires. It has an engine. It has seats and whatnot. And then maybe from that, you're able to, uh, to further inherit, you know, a Mazda, <laughs> which, uh, which has, you know, particular badging and a very de clearly defined shape. So, so we know exactly what kind of car it is. Uh, so that's that's my very generic, very basic understanding of object orientation. I was gonna say oh. that's a it's a good start. But yeah. Though, um, I think I and I believe Nelson will make it a little bit more clear. Your example started good. And yeah. Ended, and ended badly. And ended kind of badly. I'm fine with that. Yeah. See the the thing about the, that's a good yeah. Like Jason said though, that's a from someone who has never heard OOP before. That's a good way to bring them into it. Mm-hmm. But it's it's a lot more than that, really. Um, the reason why that it might be a bad example is that oftentimes your objects, like a car, is an entity that exists and it does stuff. It exhibits behavior. You know, it's this huge black box. Sure. And it doesn't really interact with the environment, or the environment doesn't really interact with it very often. And most of the time, when you're doing programming, you're writing these classes that actually plug in in some way into the ma main program or into a library or into a framework. So it's kind of like that inverted, if you know what I mean. Mm. Okay, you, I'll, I'll go with it for now. But, but I'm not really sure I know what you mean when you say that. What I mean is that, is that rarely classes exist in isolation in okay. a program. And it's often just defining a car like that, that moves forward, that maybe draws itself or something, you're describing like maybe a program. You're not necessarily describing a class. Okay. Uh, a class is usually a unit of... Uh, a, a class is an, a contract, essentially. Generally speaking, a class is a contract. A, a class is an object that interacts with other objects in a particular way. Okay. It's kind of what I'm saying. It doesn't would, generally would you, would you exhibit some behavior. I, would you object, Nelson, if I simplify it just a little bit? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't think I'm saying this right. I, so I yeah, just yeah, I, go ahead. now I, I like stepping back to just very just beginner speak for somebody like Zach, who's really who really is new to object oriented programming, and he he's he's heard all of the terms encapsulation, polymorphism, inheritance, etc. But uh, but it's easy to lose track when you don't deal with it. On the the simplest basis. way when when getting into the subject is is to look at a a class as a template or a blueprint for an entity that can be brought into existence. It can be instantiated. Um, and these these things have uh, state and they have behavior. And that's where when you were talking about your car example, then you s suddenly started talking about a very specific car. If you had, and again, I'm just going back to your example and sure. keeping it very simple, mm -hmm. you could have a car class that could hold references to the frame, to the mm -hmm. engine, to the tires, and, and those could also be classes so that we could define properties and behavior of each of those entities that go into making up the entire car. But again, if you, if you look at it as a, as a blueprint, and I say, all right, I'm going to instantiate this car, and now with this particular car, I also need to instantiate these particular tires, and I need to instantiate this particular frame and this particular engine. Now we have, we have instances of those classes that, as Nelson was talking about, they're all, they're all working interrelated in, to, together. 
And I mean, because that's that's something very common that you're going to see. You're not going to see a class that's just going to stand out there by himself, typically, do its own and, thing, right? and really do nothing. Though though there is a place for that, without a doubt. I'm sure Nelson will get to that later. But um, but then you you give this car state by you, you assign a paint color to it. You um, you, you assign the, the the tire size. You define. Um, you, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, and by doing that, you've you've given this car its own. You've made this car unique. A more specific definition. It's a, it's a very specific, it's an object. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's multiple objects that have made it up. No different than in the real world when there are, you know, blueprints out there for manufacturing a car. Mm -hmm. But when the car is actually comes off that, um, or comes out of the assembly line. Now we have this, this object, this actual representation of what the blueprints defined. But the blueprints just gave room for the state and and it defined how the behavior was going to to take place but it didn't say that you know this car will be a blue car with 14 inch rims and sure. blah 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 Th that was actually given to it when the car was brought into existence when it was instantiated okay now i know nelson this is this is really kind of taking a step back because you were diving more into a, a deeper end but that's Generally, what I like to tell people when they're completely new to, to object-oriented programming and then start easing them from there into some of the more uh, complex uses of classes. Now, if, okay. if you, you know, if you object to anything I'm saying, please. This is uh, no, no, no. <laughs> I, I don't object to anything that you're saying. The, the reason why I, I kind of went on that, uh, that sidetrack a second ago was that people often kind of – when people are learning – uh, you know how to write things in an object oriented way they they have difficulty creating these classes because the the creating the relationships and creating the interfaces between them is actually a very difficult thing and that 's why I was kind of focusing on that because that 's the most important thing i mean ultimately the behavior is just code it's it 's if statements and while statements and whatever yeah. but the the interface between your pieces of code is, is what makes something important. Mm -hmm. It's what makes it object-oriented. Absolutely. Though for, for somebody like Zach who's really new to it, just understanding the concept of an interface, and I'm not talking about an interface construct. I'm talking about just the concept of right, the, the interface with the concept. object itself. Um, is is it's going to be a little – it was there in my example. It is, it is how these things tie together and are, and are utilized and, and right. all kind of plugged together. But with, and all of that's going to become a lot more clear to you, Zach, as we go on. And see, he gives me this really awesome look at the moment. Zach got his head shaved today, so mm. he looks very intimidating. I, I look a lot more serious than I yeah, usually do. And I'm, and so I, I'm trying to adjust to how to handle him when he looks this serious because I'm not used to it that often. I'm trying to take this very seriously. <laughs> So, so yeah, that, a class is, is nothing more than a blueprint. I should have brought a notebook, so I'm tapping away on my iPad to take notes. Classes contain um, state and behavior, mm -hmm. just keeping it very simple. They, um, they um, provide encapsulation. So, so what do I mean when I say encapsulation? I guess I mean, no, 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 no. He's I talking know to me. He's talking to me. And uh -huh. honestly, I don't remember. Uh, well, it's been a long time since I've used that keep, word. Keeping, keeping encapsulation very simple. Um, when we instantiate a class, and it could be with the class itself, but I don't want to get too complicated, but mm -hmm. when we instantiate the class, we now have an object, um, and that, that object, you, you give it state. And when I say give it state, do you know what I mean by that? I think of state in the generic sense, like on-off, you know, is, is something... That, uh, that could even work, depending on the type of object. We'll keep talking while Nelson hammers out an example. Hammers, actually, the, he's, hammers he's, the word for it. He's almost done with his example right here, which is, which is actually a great one, I think. Actually, I'm going to do this, and I'll come back to why I did now, this. Uh, now, let me ask you this. Am mm -hmm. I handicapping your video right now by forcing you to go back too far? No, not okay. at no, all. No, no, this, no. This, the whole idea of Nelson's Corner is, and, and you're supposed to learn this stuff. I know, I know, I know, I know. Okay, so, uh, yeah, like what Jason is saying, that, that objects are class, objects, well, classes, yeah, classes have state. Objects have an instance of that state. Exactly. So, and, go ahead, Nelson, I'm sorry. And in this case, uh, this person has two variables in it, a first name and a last name, and these are the state of that person. Now, actually, I don't want to um, – this is actually a bad example. No, 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 no. I, I disagree. For, for someone that's, that's new, it's not in my opinion, and here's why. When we, when we instantiate this person, we could create a, a 
There we go. Person named, um, so he's got person one. I was going to say name him Bob. But um, so with, with person, so now he's going to use object initializer here just to go ahead and set first name and last name. But here's the key thing. He is setting the state in the most simplistic language. He's mm -hmm. setting the state of person one. So person one is Nelson LeKay. And he can write that out, and then he can turn right around and create person two and set it to Zach Parrish. Sure. And so the instant state of person one, Nelson LeKay, the instant state of person two for first name and last name would be Zach Parrish. So state is, I mean, is this boiling down to the value of if a property a, defined within the yeah, blueprint? Yeah, if you took a snapshot of an object yeah. at runtime, what state is it in? Okay. By, you know, what is their name? And in this case, you're now Zach now, whatever. Now, that's something that I did just pick up because usually, like I said, I think of state in a very generic sense as to, uh, like, it, uh, on and off is the easiest one, but, you know, I okay, so I, I use WoW add-ons and I've used Macaroon. So, okay. you know, when I'm dropping in buttons, I'm in a button edit state or I can be in a, ah. and, and, you know, and that's, that's kind of like a state that something is in so that I can perform various levels of and, functionality and in those states. And that's very, that's very good. Um, that kind of state, which which is very closely related to this, yeah. is something that, um, well, I mean, at, at an abstract level, it's the same thing. Right. Because the button, let's say you've got a but, button that has been instantiated, right. and now it's running in your program. It's an add-on. It's been instanced, and it has a state. It mm -hmm. may be in a normal state. And it, it most likely contains a property for its current mode. Mm -hmm. So by setting it to... Normal. Now that button acts like a normal action bar button. But I wouldn't have made the immediate association that uh, setting a property like first name or last name was literally changing the state of a class. See, well, yeah, I kind of want to um, – I mean, so do you understand the state at this point, Zach? I do. I, I do. I, I see what I, you're saying I want, now. I want to bring state in the context of encapsulation, like what, what Jason started talking about. Okay. Um, because currently – Currently, all this object is is state. It doesn't provide any behavior. And state actually extends much further than what you can publicly access. Okay. And what I mean by that is that a person state might be something like... So here's a... Uh, now, see, that, that rings a little more to what I'm used to in terms of thinking of state. You know, you can be in an alive state or a dead state. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't mean I don't mean that kind of state. I, mean, I know, yeah, I know, that's why, that's why I, I know, I know. That's what I'm saying, though. I know, I, and I'm with you. I come from an English language background, and so you know, when you when you hear yeah, the word state, you're, that's you're, you're reducing or you're taking this back to like even if you're dealing with AI, the, right. the state of a um, an actor, it's it's hungry, sure, it's attacking. Mm -hmm. um, but what Nelson's getting at is all of these properties, yeah. private, public. All of the, the local members, the fields, they all play the role in defining the state at any given time for an instance of an object. So would you say the state is a, a culmination of all of these properties? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Absolutely. But, uh, and now, well, as far as a, a encapsulation goes, um, in this case, the person class doesn't actually exhibit any behavior. Okay. But, well, um, that's, well that's, that's, that's yeah. That's to keep in mind. Right. Again, state behavior. Right. That's the two things classes right. have. Right. Right. Behavior I'm is with different. That. Well, the thing about state is that state usually shouldn't – it depends on the type of object that you're working with. And this is going to come into design patterns. There are so many different types of classes that you can be working with at any given moment. And we'll get into a few of those definitions um, later, the different archetypes of classes. But generally speaking, when you have a, a class that is behavior-rich, it doesn't expose state like this. It doesn't have a first name and a last name. Mm -hmm. um, with a setter, and that's the important thing, because right here, the the state, you said the state was a culmination of all of the the variables in the class, which is correct. But the state, in a more abstract sense, is is the current ability for this class to perform an operation. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily something that anyone else knows about, or something that anyone else can publicly set, as you see with the, these. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess that has to – we have to start talking about behavior and operations now because we just – in order to make this class any more interesting, we have to introduce behavior. So and behavior would – I mean, that, does that come back to the standard English definition of what something does? Please tell me it does. Well, yeah, it's what it does. 
It's the operations that you can perform on it. I have to be careful coming into programming kind of fresh like I am. I mean, I know, I know logic, and like I said, I do a whole lot of scripting, but then I start getting deeper into programming, and I find out that most of the words of the English language that I really do swear to God I know the definition of don't actually apply in the way that I would apply them in the real world, and <laughs> nothing gets more frustrating to somebody who feels like they have a, a very basic command of the English language. Well, yes, it's the things that uh, the things they do will do All right. or can do. Okay, so here's something that the this class can do. Mm -hmm. And so we can replace this and say person one dot tell the console our name. And then it'll print out mm -hmm. you know Nelson Lacay. Sure. And and one quick note is I know that some people have gone past uh, this particular moment, but I do want to uh, bring in some stuff that will I, I do want to start defining classes in a more abstract way than just, you know, basic, you know, it has methods and then it has properties. Sure. And if, if you kind of understand the, the relationship between methods and properties and classes, mm -hmm. then, uh, yeah, I, I kind of want to go into the more abstract sense of, of designing a class. Fire away. I've, I've seen this kind of design before, so if you've got a new way to apply it, rock on. Well, see, this, this kind of design in particular is this isn't a real good design. Okay. That's because every class should have a single responsibility. It's that's called the uh, the single responsibility principle or SRP. And this person class now has kind of two responsibilities. It holds these two values and it prints them to the screen. It okay. kind of has two different responsibilities. So what we should do is we should break this out into two classes. To, to fix, to remember, SRP, single responsibility principle, every class should have one responsibility. And we will break that up into a person printer. And so now we no longer violate the uh, SRP, but you see now we don't have a person, uh, we don't have the first name and last name right. properties. Right. You have two separate so jobs, have, one to store and one to talk, basically. Right. So now we have to pass it in as part mm -hmm. of the as part of a parameter. And now we instantiate a, uh, a person printer. Right, person printer, and then you have to pass in person one as the variable. Okay, that's the first really important OOP principle is SRP. And, um, and if you notice, this method name is no longer valid. Zach? I, I see you, but uh, I'm not, yeah, I'm not following what you mean. What I mean is that this, this method name no longer represents what this method does. And method it's, helps. Because it's not our name. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Now, exp explain to Zach what you're doing here. Um, I'm uh, renaming this. Right. And that's so, going to rename it in both like locations. The yeah. most basic, basic form of refactoring in the world. Okay. So now it renamed it there, and it renamed it there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we have two objects, both or classes, both of them have different responsibilities. And you'll notice this appear a lot. You'll notice a lot of classes have a bunch of pro public properties. And these are generally, generally classes that just store data. And you generally don't really do much behavior on them because it's just, well, it stores data. It passes data around. It passes data from one object that performs... Um, perform something to another object that performs something. And I can demonstrate that by introducing a third class. Um, I don't know. Person constructor. That's a bad name because it's already in use by programming. Um, kind of going back to what you said, Zach. Oh, isn't it frustrating? <laughs> you have like the perfect word for something. Like, oh, nope, you can't use that because that means something else. And it's like, ah, <laughs> dang it. Um, person creator. Or how about, yeah, that's fine. That's fine for now. You didn't want to use person and factor, just, did you? I just wanted to throw this out there real quick. When you asked me uh, why the one method wasn't valid, what threw me off was actually the use of the word valid in this case because I, I assumed that invalid code simply wouldn't work, and that code uh, was indeed working. 
And so I was like, okay, wait a minute, what's the problem? And what you actually meant was this code is not succinctly named anymore. And I'll, I'll often say that because... That's fine. Uh, as, as long as I know what you mean when, you, when you're speaking of validity, then we're fine. But we have to establish these definitions early on. Okay. And because you'll notice is, is this is about object-oriented design, rather. Not right. just using objects in your code, sure. but coming up with how to design them. Mm -hmm. And so at this point, we've defined two different classes, with, or three different classes, with three different responsibilities. And so do you understand the responsibility of this guy? Well, let's see. Uh, it's going to allow us to input some information, being a first name and a last name, to define a person. Yeah. Yep. And actually, we can uh, do something cool here. Let's use delegates. I like delegates. Be before you do, though, Zach, finish in describing what that does. You actually fell short on describing what it did. I did. I uh, okay. Yes. So, look very carefully at the method. This is this is good because I'm really wanting you to grasp this stuff. All right, well, let's see. It is going to, uh, well, the console is going to be open. It's going to look for a line. We're going to enter in a first name. Now, it's that's, not actually getting, it's not I, asking us anything. I, let me, let me. Yeah, that's what I was going to fix, but, let me, but let that's me, besides the point. Yeah, that's beside the point. Let's start with just looking at the method itself. Look at the signature of the method. How many parameters does this method take in? None. How many does it return? It returns a person. Uh, One. Now, now re explain. That's what, what I, I was getting to. But I mean, that, that's what I. Okay, that's where I thought I was getting to until the, this, just this very moment, okay. was that it was going to take in data from the user and store the first bit as the first name, the second bit as the last name, and it would return that in the, in the form of a person. Okay, yep. it, creates a, it creates a new person, his return right. new person. It creates a new person, sets the, the instant state of that person, and returns so that what back I, to whoever called Could you off. say I had the, the order in the wrong sense where it creates the person first and then we're defining those properties within the person? Uh, it actually, it is. This is shorthand for... Yeah. Okay. Here, let, me, let me write it out. Let me write it out real fast. Because, I mean, yeah, I see what it would be doing, but I, I'd love to know that I actually had the, the order of the data formation in the wrong order. That way, you know, I, I learn how that's working. So that's, that's what it's doing written out, but I'm using the uh, shorthand object initialization syntax. Okay. Hang on one so, sec, Nelson. He's taking notes like a madman. <laughs> all right, go ahead. I I'm with you. Okay. So um, I'm actually going to introduce delegates real fast just because. Well, we already introduced delegates, so I can just use this. This formatted how I wanted it to, but between ReSharper and Visual Studio, it just wants to screw with me. So here we go. Okay, so do you kind of understand what's going on there? Well, let's see. Just a quick, quick quiz on delegates and lambdas. Yeah, it's been a minute, hasn't it? Two string, those are going to get stored into a value P, which is going to go into this little bit of code. So it looks like it's doing the same thing it was doing a second ago. Except for that we're printing something first. Okay, yeah, you're right. I see, I see now. Uh, let's see. We're going to be writing... Are you writing the word first name? Yeah. We're grabbing a p from this uh, variable, this argument, right, which is right there, mm -hmm. which is passed in by these guys. Okay. So the the literal, oh, I think, yeah, that's what you said. The literal first name, the literal last name. See, the data flow is that it, it starts here. So first name goes into prompt. Okay. Yeah. 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 And then an, uh, it'll be first name, then a new line, and then last name, and then a new line. Okay, yeah, it just took me a second to catch back up. Yeah, I'm glad you said data flow. That was the, the key there. You were having a hard time looking at it. Okay, so now we're going to uh, drop out of this and do... Okay, so now if we... Uh...
do this, we get first name, last name, right. and then the name. And I, I hate how trivial this example is because um, – I'm sure someone later on is going to, you know, poke fun at me and say I'm a Java program or something. Um, but we are trying to dis- uh, we're trying to explain these these object oriented principles and just ignore the example for now because these will definitely be expanded on as we write more code. Sure. And, more and code. you're actually doing more than that, Nelson. So I just want to make sure to tack this on. And that is, he's not just explaining the object oriented examples of like a class here. You're actually getting into a little bit of design now. Yes, and that, that's kind of what very I, important. What the well design <laughs> design patterns are about Absolutely. is is this sort of thing. And so yeah, so now we have our person creator and our person printer and our person. So these all have different responsibilities, and that's important, very important. Right. So, well, um, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna play like Zach just sure. in case he doesn't realize to ans- ask certain questions sometimes. That's fine. If you don't mind. Um, yeah. So why? Why is it important? Why couldn't we have just put it all in person, Nelson? Uh, the problem is is that your code becomes, well, brittle. When you, when you put so many responsibilities into a single class, you, your class becomes less useful in more situations, if that makes sense. It, you can't use it in other contexts. For example, if we have create person and person, print person both in our person object or person class – we're having we're having code that is coupled to our console.write library inside of our person class which doesn't make any sense because what if we wanted to populate person from a a, a website or a uh, a database or a file mm-hmm. and then so now we're putting in all these responsibilities into person and person will just grow and grow and grow and it'll be an unorganized mess and object oriented design is about making code not a mess and a person who hasn't ever spent time looking into object oriented design will will say, you know, what's the problem? This is how I've always done it. But uh, believe me, when when the uh, believe me when I say that when the when you start thinking about design critically, your code just it's easier to navigate. Okay, it's easier to understand and it's easier to reuse. And those are kind of the tenets of OOP. Right, and that all comes back to the single responsibility principle you discussed earlier. And I guess right. you would you would say that that would be a fundamental principle for object oriented programming. Yes. All right. So yeah. So and then then I want to say a few things. Is that uh, is oh, person- actually I, I do have a question. Real okay. quick, let me let yeah. me throw this out. When you're just coding, when you're sitting around, you've been given a certain task, and you're just okay. I'm going to program some stuff. Uh, do you often find yourself Sticking to like SRP right away, or do you start coding something and then you look up and go like, "Oh man, I've got this thing doing like three or four things," and then you break it back out? Um, yes and no. Uh, yes, I'm always constantly making sure that my code is sanely designed, mm-hmm. but no, in that you can never predict when something, someone's responsibilities are start going to start to you know become so diverse. You can never predict that, and that brings in another important word called refactoring. Right. And have you? Do you know what that refactoring means? It isn't. It, well, I mean, only a very tiny bit. Only what I've seen you guys do, which it's it's redesigning your code on the fly. Generally, you guys have been using it, what ReSharper to do that for you. Uh, well, ReSharper provides us a few refactorings, but uh, re- refactoring is about uh, representing having code that does the exact same thing, but in a in a better way. Yeah. So either more performant Making or your code better designed. Better. Yes. Okay. Well, I mean, I was just throwing in that because that 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 concept uh, raises its head in the artistic world time and time again with people saying, you know, well, it, it's best practice to do X, Y, and Z, but you know, I don't feel like I can actually get anything done because I never can manage to do X, Y, Z while I'm just working. And I have to tell people all the time, like, okay, for for modeling, people get all hung up on topology, and I have to often tell people, look, just model and get the shape right, then go back and make sure your topology is right. And it seems like. That could apply here as well in what you're saying with with things like uh, the standard single responsibility principle, where you know if you're just coding and you've got an idea of how something would work, and you start getting the the functionality in there, even like what you just did a second ago, you got uh, person the the person class, it took in data and then it printed, and then you stop and went, oh well, this needs to be broken out into separate classes. I was just kind of verifying that that sort of activity was fairly common. Oh yeah, yeah, that that's. That is pretty common, but if you're if you always keep a keen eye on this, it shouldn't ever get to the point where refactoring actually makes a huge problem. I agree. I, mean? I agree. You yeah. should be able to catch it early. Yeah. 
And so, so now with this design, we have made the person class a lot more useful while making it use more useless at the same time. And that's because we can now use the same person class in other areas that don't necessarily depend on the console. Mm -hmm. So now this person class is actually a type of class. And the type of class is, it is it's called a, a DTO or data transmission object. Okay. And I'll, I'll be using DTO a lot. And a DTO is, is really just a dumb object that carries around state. It just carries around its values. Okay. okay. So, so the person class is a DTO, and it doesn't really have any behavior. So, well, and it just has state. So, therefore, it's a DTO, and that's how we're using it here because we're passing it around. You see how person printer and person creator actually they don't, work with the data. Right. They work with this person contract or this person DTO. They don't ever they don't ever have to communicate directly with each other, which is another huge thing, decoupling. Have you, have you heard about decoupling? I've heard or, the word said many, many times. <laughs> decoupling is about making your classes not depend on each other. And I know that might, inter, in, um, I know that might contradict what I said earlier about that object oriented programming is about designing your interactions but um, interactivity and dependence are two entirely different things uh, uh two objects two people i mean can interact and not necessarily depend on one another for any given thing so i still see where you're coming from right so that's so decoupling is 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 very important and as you see right here the person printer and the person creator are not coupled at all mm -hmm. They have no dependency on each other, so they can be both used in isolation. The only thing they really depend on is the person. Right, which is your DTO in this case. Yes. So um, I think now might be a good time to talk about uh, interfaces, uh, if you're comfortable with what we've talked about so far. I'm good. So, yeah, okay. show me what interfaces are, because that that's one where, I mean, I know the word, and again, we come back to me understanding what an interface is in the real world and then in the programming world it means something different so I'm not allowed to say the word anymore <laughs> okay well an interface describes a contract it it um, it's a way around static typing and I, I'm gonna get into typing in a second here when we uh, when start typing out some uh, interfaces and by typing I don't mean like keyboard typing I mean Static versus dynamic typing. See what I'm saying? <laughs> Doesn't it get fun? Like, the deeper you go, the more fun it gets. Now, I thought a delegate defined a contract. It does, in a way. Okay. And I mean... Is an interface similar in any way to a delegate? Um, you can think of a delegate like an interface with one method on it. Okay. That's a start. And... So I, wouldn't, let's, I wouldn't try to relate the two. Okay, that's fine. And, and uh, yeah, it's fine with just saying they, they don't really relate in the way that, that you started to suggest. That's okay. I just remember you using other words, so I'm trying to see if there is any correlation. The, I'm fine with being told no. The way I like to, to describe an interface is it's when you write an interface, you're writing a contract. Mm -hmm. um, and then if somebody implements that interface, they must follow that contract. The, the compiler is going to make sure you follow the contract. Okay, so give me an example so I understand the nature of this contract. Okay, so we have a person creator and a person printer. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's let's now you're gonna you 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 are going to ask me why should we ever do this? And so if you ever feel that you need to ask that question, wait until the next section and then ask that question. <laughs> why should we ever use this, Nelson? <laughs> <laughs> because. You'll see. You'll. You'll. Uh, it'll seem really unimportant in this first example, but it's leading up to something important. I'm used to that. So we ha we're going to create an I person creator. And I guess and I is just the designator for an interface. It's a, yeah. It's a convention. Mm -hmm. So interfaces inside their uh, their method uh, or inside their um, body, they can contain uh, events, uh, properties, methods. And that's it. So you don't have to qualify anything with an ac accessor like uh, right here. So we have public right here mm -hmm. stating that this is a public property. Interfaces don't need that because everything in an interface is implicitly public. Okay. There's no way to create an interface that somehow just describes a private contract because that would defeat the purpose. So we write 
our methods just as we do. I'm actually I'm gonna keep it up there. We write our methods just as we do in classes, but we don't give them bodies. Okay. So we're gonna do person create person. So if this were a class, I, well, that gets into abstract, which is the same thing. But um, so we well, not exactly, but anyway. So we have a create person method, and like I said, this is gonna be implicitly public. There's no way. There's no reason to describe it right here mm -hmm. as you do in classes and this is a method that returns a person and takes no arguments which is exactly what this does right takes so the, the key so, thing to note here is there's no implementation to the method oh, yes and there is a terminator at the end of that line all right so really all you're doing is defining the fact that you know you're going to have a method called create person and that it's going to return a person and to, that's to the keep that you're, you're right to keep it real simple yeah. you could say anyone who imp anyone being any class mm -hmm. who implements the iPerson creator interface must have a public person uh, create person method in it. Okay. Must. If okay. not, it's not going to build. All right. Okay. So to implement an interface. Hey Nelson, why would you ever want to do this? I'm sorry. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Actually, it's the next section. I'm still on the same section. Right now. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. Quiet, I'm being terrible. Okay. So to implement this interface on this person creator, mm -hmm. we do that. All right. And that's basically how we designate that we're utilizing iPerson now, creator. are you familiar yep. with inheritance there? Didn't we just talk about it a minute ago? We, we mentioned it, but okay. we, we've really just been talking about classes and, and keeping, um, you know, the responsibility down to just a single thing within each class. Well, since we're not talking about someone's living will and things like that, let's just say that I'm uh, vaguely well, we're familiar. Since, since the discussion right now is, is interfaces, I just wanted to mention this because I don't know if you've seen the syntax before, how he's got class, person, creator, then he's got the colon there. Mm -hmm. This is where we can then define what Inherits we're going from. to inherit from or implement as far as an interface goes. Mm -hmm. We can only inherit in, in C Sharp from one class. Okay. But we can implement multiple interfaces. Oops, That's Zach, interesting. Zach's no, you're, you're good. Up. You're good. I, I can do two things at once. <laughs> Go ahead, Nelson. Okay. So, yeah. So, like Jason was saying, uh, this is the same syntax as implement or inheriting, but we'll get to the uh, the rules about inheriting. Yeah, I just wanted to toss it out there in case Zach suddenly sees some yeah. example with inheritance and goes, wait a minute, but that doesn't have an I in it and it's not an interface. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. So, so Zach, um, this method, this this code compiles right now. Mm -hmm. um, I say Control Shift B, and it says build succeeded. So, just a quick note. Sure. Um, this code compiles, and the reason it compiles is because this person creator implements this I person creator in that it fulfills this contract. Right. If I were to break that contract, it shouldn't okay, build then. anymore. It's not yep. implemented. Yeah. So that's, yeah, I think we went over this at some point in the uh, delegates video. We need to hurry up and get to the next section because I'm dying to know why you'd ever want to do this. <laughs> okay, so now we have this I person creator. And there's one quick note. Um, in C Sharp, there is actually a way, this is kind of bizarre, you're probably, you're probably seriously not going to understand the need for this. And, and I, I, do I appreciate your vote of confidence like, ahead of time, though. <laughs> I do in a weird sort of OCD organizational way. But it's actually valid. Um, actually, there is a practical reason, and I'm going to show that to you really fast. This is not practical in the sense that code's practical. It's practical in the sense is if you ever find yourself in this position. Let's say you have two interfaces with two, na two methods that have the same name. Mm -hmm. And let's say you inherit... You inherit or implement. Thank you. Uh, you implement multiple <laughs> interfaces with a comma, and then the other interface. Okay. Now, what happens when you have this code? I would think it would just work because I don't see you being able to have two different methods of the same name. But I mean, it's possible that you can. I really don't know for sure whether that works or not. Well, at the moment, it does work. Okay. And that's because this person creator fulfills both these contracts with the single method. That's what I figured. Uh, I didn't think you'd be able, you would need or even be able to have two separate create persons. But you can. You can, okay. Well, that's good to know. Watch this. This is called the uh, explicit uh, implementation syntax, I believe. I think that's what's, I don't know. It's called something like that. Um, it's, are, you it's where you are you basically going to designate which one of these methods goes with which contract? Yep. Okay, right there. And you don't give it a private, you just say that. Right. And this is actually a private method. You cannot 
access this create person method from a person creator. You can only access it when a person creator is casted into an I person creator. And I'll get into that in a second. Okay. So that's those are the, if you ever see if you ever seen the uh, the some of the tools ask you if you want to implement a method or implement an interface explicitly or implicitly. Mm -hmm. This is implicit implementation. This is explicit implementation. And yeah, so if you've ever seen that, that's what it means. All right. So now I'm going to delete this worthless example, and I'm going to come up here and actually there's going to be one more section before the section that this makes sense. Um, that is talking about types. So you see that I'm using implicit typing right here, and I'm going to turn this into explicit typing right now, just to, um, yeah, I know ReSharper's going to yell at me, and that's going to drive me crazy. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and explicitly type everything. Why? I've, <laughs> God. Okay, so then we come back here, and let's create a method that uh, takes a person, or, yeah, it takes a person, like, why not? Like... Do stuff. Now, I can do stuff with people. Mm -hmm. hmm. Right? And that's because this person um, is, a person uh, is a person type, and this method takes a person. Sure. But I can't do stuff with a person creator. Go ahead and put the Terminator at the... There you go. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it takes a person. Yes, it takes a different type. Right. Now, the reason why interfaces are useful is because I can now basically subvert C-sharp's typing system by saying, okay, so if I take instead an iPerson creator, now this, this method right here is valid for any class or any yeah any class that implements i person creator. So you see that person creator works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but why is that special? Couldn't you just change the type up and do stuff in the first place, and it still would have worked? Like, couldn't you just change it to take in a person creator anyway? You could, and um, that, that's just a quick overview of the typing system. Uh, there's it extends much further than that, but but that's I mean, the only thing how, how does that tie into? the whole idea of an interface because you could have just gone up and said, all right, now we take person creators instead of just persons and now it works. Why was it so special to go up and grab the interface? Because, okay, so let's go ahead and create a third object or a fourth object. I, I can't count. One, two, three. Okay. Third Is this object. fourth object going to answer my third, question? Class. Fourth class. class. Uh, sorry, I was about to get on class, both of you guys. <laughs> or fifth class. I only said it because he was saying it. Or sixth class. So no, there's six types. For those of you that are watching, us, the time to hit pause and go get a drink. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just a quick note. Uh, interfaces, delegates, What can you teach me about counting? Hang on. Go ahead, Nelson. You're about to say something important. Inter interfaces, delegates, uh, de de delegates, enumerations, classes, and structs are all types. So th these are all types, but these guys are just classes. So that's why I said there are six types or whatever. But you'll see that verbiage uh, elsewhere in the typing system with C Sharp, which we'll definitely have to get into because there's a lot of stuff that you can do with it. Okay, so what if we wanted to create a third class with, or a, another class with a, uh, another responsibility? And that responsibility is going to be to interact with a person creator and a person printer. All right. So what he's going to do is, um, actually, let me type this into Google so I don't embarrass myself with my typing. Okay, so this is a, we're going to call him a person orchestrator, but paste doesn't work. So manager, no, I hate that word. <laughs> service, we're going to call him a person service. There we go. And we'll talk about services later. Um, and he's going to have a constructor because this person service, his responsibility is he's going to um, basically do this right here. Okay. I, that's exactly what he's going to do. You mean this exact same thing that that Maine is already doing for us? Yes. Allow, but we're going to put it into a class. Allow me to step in for one sec, Nelson, just to say this to Zach. Mm -hmm. Since you are um, – since since he's going over some basic object-oriented stuff as we work up towards design, do you understand what a constructor is? Uh, yeah, I forgot about that. Mm, 
that's good. That's fine. Only remotely. I mean, I've seen it, and I know there are times when I've stared at a constructor. If you told me to write one for you right now, I'm not entirely sure that I could. It is. You'll notice that the name he used is the same as the class name. Sure. It's public, and what? Though it can be private, but that gets into more design stuff. It's, I was gonna say I don't think I've ever understood what a constructor is really there for. It is there to provide a means of some functionality to occur the moment an object is instantiated. Oh, groovy. So, which is what Nelson's about to take advantage of right here. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and say this person service requires two objects to work. He needs a person creator and a person printer. Okay. So we're going to do, we're going to pass in an I person creator, and then we're going to come up here and create our I person printer interface because I forgot about that. Uh, printer... Okay, so we have our iPerson printer and our iPerson creator. I think you said that backwards. Well, I, I mean, they're, they're still both there, so <laughs> I'll go with it. You just have to read it backwards. Okay, then I'm going to use ReSharper to write code for me. Just as long as you tell me what in the world it's writing <laughs> and why. Oh, uh, you can ignore this for now. We'll go over immutability later. But um, He just had uh, it simply see, create two private okay. fields to store See, the data that comes in. Go ahead. See, Jason, this is why I don't like this, this uh, the underscore with or no uh, underscore. It doesn't bother me because this is a case where this is required. I know this is redundant most times and people still use it, but I still think it helps with readability. But in this case, it's actually required because if you well, don't have this on there, which But it wouldn't be required it, if it was like that. <sighs> Yeah, but that's not Microsoft's Wow, convention. now you're sighing, too. This is awesome. This is because Nelson's really good at following convention. Total and this is role just, reversal. just dot .NET convention. That's, yeah. a, that's how they... Like I said, I've reflected on I know, MS and you, can not yeah. only, you don't have to just reflect on it. You can dig through their help. Even in their help, you'll find examples, C-sharp examples, utilizing an underscore with private members. Okay, it's time for me to roll back into the room and, and grab everyone's attention then. So now <laughs> what you've done is you started the... Well, okay, we've created the person service class and the constructor is determining that as soon as we instantiate this class we're going to take in creator and printer and store those we have to we have those. to okay, okay. Yes. and we have to because they're utilizing these interfaces Be no somewhere down to. the line wait 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 no 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 okay we have to because the person service constructor takes in these two parameters right right so they have to okay. be provided okay these aren't optional okay. and also this makes up state but these aren't publicly accessible this is an example of a class that that isn't a DTO but has a state. Okay. And they're private, and that's generally most generally. I have some conflicting thoughts about properties, especially setters, but I won't get into that right now. Just note that there's no reason for this person service to ever expose these guys publicly. So that's why they're private. That's kind of right. what I'm saying. Yeah, I'll just have so, to kind of go with you on that because it's like I. I I keep coming back to well, if they if they can't be exposed, I mean, can they still be utilized? Yes, right. they can be utilized within this class, and that's okay. Fair enough. Encapsulation. encapsulation. Very good. So okay. we're gonna do um, uh, create and print person, and then we're gonna do this. We're gonna do person equals creator dot create person uh, printer. Uh, print person, person, and Sharper's yelling at me about, because they're not read-only, but I'll get into that in a little bit. Now, let me ask you this, okay. just real quick, only because you started the whole thing. If you have a class that is called create and print person, is it not breaking the single responsibility principle? It As it is creating of, and then it is printing? Yes, it is and it isn't. And Okay, I'm, is, I'm fine with the is part because that's why I asked the question, but what, what about the, the isn't? <laughs> The isn't is because um, the responsibility of the person service is kind of to – it's a terrible name for it, kind of. Like I can come up with a really I'm, – I'm actually really bad with naming, and that's one of the worst parts about my code. You were on to something with Orchestrator, yeah. I think. Yeah, Orchestrator, but I can't spell that, and I'll embarrass myself. Well, see, so, I, I could spell it for you, but I wasn't sure you'd be able to find the letters anyway, so I just kept my mouth shut. <laughs> oh. Okay, anyway, so so we have this uh, this class, and its responsibility is to – 
create and print a person, but it delegates that to these two specific objects. So its responsibility is to combine these two without actually requiring that these two are coupled. Okay. Yeah, I and see what's you'll going notice on. something. Okay. So now we can go ahead and create this. So oh, let me just add to this though, and that is that that class that he just created does the the person service does have a single objective. It has yes. a single task. It just needs a little like extra information in order to pull it off. Okay. Because if we had if we had the implementation of both create person and print person here, mm -hmm. that would be two responsibilities. But because we've abstracted that away, we can now orchestrate with them without having to know anything about the inner workings. Well, see, that's funny. It's just like what I'm pulling out of it is that it's okay because we named the thing create and print person. We just we just said that's <laughs> what it's going to do from the start. So yeah, that's one responsibility. It's like it, we <laughs> it, we've decided it's one thing because we said so. Yeah, that's that's true. Um, yeah, that that is true. It's it's up to what you name it as, and but there, you have to develop an intuition, kind of, you know, like it, there's no rule that you can really apply to everything and then have that magically work. Now that was profound. Okay, okay. I'll I'll just go with it. But so, true in the yeah yeah you're well it's true it's true in the in the whole world. But do you see what I'm getting at in this case? It has it has what looks like multiple things, but those sure. I mean, it, it, if the end goal was just a print person, that's great. But it needs the person in order the, to print and it. it. So yeah, I see, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, okay. so, and I'm just I'm, I know I'm trying I'm trying not to be argumentative, but it really did at the outset look like you had designed something that was actually doing two jobs. And I now I mean I see now after talking about it why it kind of has to, but I just didn't know if that was actually breaking the uh, the SRP and. If that was okay, if it was. The, the, the thing is, is, is the service, I don't know if it's a pattern. I can't say service pattern, but it's a very common, commonly used word for this type of class. See, I always think and, of some little system that's always running in my computer in the background. <laughs> anyway, so. <laughs> what? It's true. <laughs> all right, go ahead. Fine. Okay, all right. All right. Show. So, so uh, <laughs> services are commonly used in, in programming or in design to kind of orchestrate multiple classes that don't need to directly know anything about each other. That's kind of what a service is. Okay. So that's why I named it service, but I didn't want to go into the definition, but I guess I already did, so it defeated the purpose. Story of okay. my life. <laughs> so now we're instantiating this person service, but you notice that there is an error. Yeah, we're not taking anything in. Yep. So it has two parameters, but is invoked with zero arguments. So we need to pass in two objects. And what and those would be one, whatever the creator is in the printer? Yes. One of those objects has to satisfy the iPerson creator interface, and another one of those objects has to, inst uh, has to um, provide the iPerson printer interface. So, will so we, we or we'll be creating two new things, and they'll make sure to have a colon iPerson creator in them? Mm, I'm, just, well, I'm taking actually, a just random guess. I'm throwing darts at the wall to see which ones stick. See, we've we've already done that. We didn't do it here because I missed it, and it's totally my fault. So actually, Zach just caught that. Good job. <laughs> so we have these two classes, and both of these fulfill this interface. Look, if you're throwing a dart blindfolded, you don't get credit for a bullseye. <laughs> so we have these two uh, these two classes that we can readily use. Okay. That already satisfied this interface. So we're going to pass in a person creator and a new person printer. And those work because those do implement the appropriate interfaces. Yep. Okay. And you can see if it switched over, we have a iPerson creator. Okay. Um, I'm actually going to rename both of these guys because now we're getting into something different um, where we're actually supplying an implementation of both of these interfaces. And a person creator is really generic. That's a terrible name for what this class does. Now, the person creator up here is good because it's it's really generic, and that's what an interface should be. It should be generic. It should explain what it and does, but not how it does it. Yeah, I completely agree because I was about to play the Zach role and say, okay, I still don't understand why you just didn't send the type to begin with and why you needed to actually implement the interface. And, yeah, the naming is bad in this case. So I'm going to go ahead and call this code and then show that it works, and then I'm going to ask Zach a question. So, Zach, can you think of a better name for both of these classes? Uh, let's see. The first one, I mean, if you're just talking about trying to be succinct about it, uh, maybe person namer. 
Well, not really being succinct. It's about describing because we've abstracted the contract into this interface. Uh-huh. All of these classes, they shouldn't just say person creator. They should describe their implementation, but in a, still in an abstract way, but describe how they do it. You know what I mean? I know what you they mean. Should, I mean, you, the, you're saying the class should the class's name should define what it does. It, so, no, it should define how it does it. Okay. Well, not, not exactly define how it does it, but to some degree, that's kind of like a gray area. Because this describes what it does. So, I mean, yeah. what? Are you saying this should be named, like, uh, console person name input? Well, no, you're on to something. Oh, that's close. That's yeah, close. you're on to something. Very good. Um, console person namer? I mean, I'm just, like I said, I'm back to throwing darts just based on what you're saying. Well, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that we might have, we can have as many classes as we want implement this iPerson creator sure, interface. Sure, sure. I have got one right now that allows the user yes. that requires the user to define the name. Mm-hmm. You could make another person creator, or excuse me, let me say that properly. You could create another I person creator that instead of they did it procedurally, asking, it could just define the name. Yeah, it could like, be like just, from a list of randoms or something. You could yes. do that. Like, pr- yeah. totally procedurally. Yep, absolutely. So you're like we could also you, def- so you're something like user based like like person, user-based creator. person creator. Um. Yeah, that would work, but I would probably go one step more concrete than that okay. because we might have another person creator that shows a Windows form. Okay. So I would call it console person creator. Okay, I was close. No, you, you had the right idea. So now we have a console person printer. And now you see it renamed these two guys. Mm-hmm. So now... Our code doesn't change at all. It still works just sure, fine. Sure, sure. Well, because you just person, redefine some names, nothing more. Yeah. And this person service, it still only cares about does this object satisfy the iPerson creator and does this object satisfy the iPerson pr- printer um, constraints right here. But we're now passing in. Now it makes – does this make more sense like as to how – as to why we abstracted it into interfaces? Because we can now, like you said, we can do something like this. And I'm going to use ReSharper to implement the members for me. So that just created that one method that is part of this interface magically. Um, so then we're just going to do this. We're going to do... Uh, well, see, like so far, the only reason I can glean that you'd want to implement an interface is if you knew in advance that you needed a very particular type or form of data by the time you get to a certain point in your code. And so you're going to make sure that any further implementations at least get that for you. But can, can I can I give you an example? Sure, please. MMO. Yeah. Your interface. It and, all I comes mean, back to WoW. Th- that's right. So in your inventory, is every item in your inventory usable? No. Aha. Uh-huh. So when defining items in an MMO, if you were to write an MMO, you could usable items could implement the I usable interface. Sure. Okay. So then if you were – now you're a player. Mm-hmm. You opened your inventory. You moved your mouse over a piece of cloth, which isn't usable, and you clicked on it to use it. In code, you could say if that object is an I usable, mm-hmm. then call that object's use because we know any object that implements the I usable interface – is will have by a definition use, usable. It, 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 meaning it will have a use method. It's mm-hmm. guaranteed. Again, that goes back to what Nelson was saying about there's a contract in place. Right. So when we say, is this item in this slot, is it I usable? Answer, no. So now I move over to a mana potion. Is this item I usable? Yes. All well, right. Item dot use. So well, it's, like, it's it. funny, too, because it comes back to an idea I've had about interfaces since I first heard about them. And I just wasn't going to say it on the video until now, but it seems like the whole purpose they exist is to keep you and other programmers from screwing something up in the future. Because mm. it's like, you know, that, that's why you're making sure that you're, you're putting all this stuff in place. It's, it's almost like a check and balance system then. Because, I mean, okay, so you have an object, you want to make sure that it's usable. By forcing this contract on it, you're going to know in advance that somebody had to put in a, a use method, like you say. Mm-hmm. And so in that sense, it, it is just, it's, it's almost like a watchdog. But the, Yeah, it, well, because it's guaranteed there's a contract. But at the most simple level, you can say that that item 
is that interface type. So if I was to say, um, you know, is but, this item... And this that, that comes back to me. Is that, that sounds more like verbal syntax than anything. Because you happen to have an interface on here, you can now say that this particular item is an I usable. And that's just the syntax you use because you implemented an interface on it. Mm -hmm. That, that doesn't that keeps, seem particularly special. But that Oh, it's very special, especially in design. Because when designing the inventory system, the inventory system is very generic. It just knows it's going to work with items, but it doesn't know what items are going to be in those slots. But it knows that if you just happen to click on an item that is a usable item, it needs to let that item handle whatever it needs to do for it being used. So it's a way to it's a way to keep you from having to check and see if this thing has a use method. Because Let's see, I think though what Jason's not saying though is that there is no other way to do it. Yeah, there is no other type language. Okay, <laughs> this is how you do it. Okay. Yeah, there's no fair enough. There, there, there is dynamic typing in C sharp. There is reflection. There are ways around it. But you know, it, normally under normal circumstances, you use interfaces to express that, that sort of express that use case of passing around objects without caring about their implementation details. What you're describing, Zach, is you're describing what's called the duck typing. And duck typing is called duck typing because of the, the phrase or whatever, uh, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, then it's a duck. Right. And the principle of duck typing, it's used in dynamic languages where you just literally, your methods, like my, my um, these two methods would just take objects or they would just take whatever. They would take, you know, dynamic things in a, in JavaScript, it would be var or whatever, you know, they would take, they wouldn't have types, they wouldn't have these interfaces. And then we would call the create person and the print person. Mm-hmm. And we would just call it. There wouldn't be any interface. Right, and it's just and that's like it, in this in this particular case, it's like I understand that you're using interfaces because you're trying to teach about interfaces. But in this particular case, I'm having a little bit of a hard time seeing why we absolutely had to have an interface in the first place. Well, I okay. Well, first of all, uh, as I was typing this code right here, uh -huh. um, and that whole time I was talking with Jason. So. Yeah, go ahead and walk yeah, through. What yeah, you please. I, I do also want to point out that I did bring in um, two. Using statements okay. with three sharper. Thank you. Anyone who's listening. Um, okay, so this is a random person creator. Okay. So here is a class that takes an enumerable of person people mm -hmm. as the constructor or as a constructor argument, and then on its create person method, it returns a random person out of that list. Sure. And I use link to get, I, well, I get the next random number in the random object. That's how you generate random numbers in .NET. And then I skip that many people, or that many, yeah, that many people, and then I do .single on it okay. to grab the first, to grab the item that resulted after the skip. So those are the two link methods that let me do that, skip and single. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we have this random person creator. So now we can come down here and we can instantiate an I person creator. And it's, it's going to get ugly, so I'm going to break it out into a line above it. And you'll notice that this guy requires a constructor argument, an I enumerable a person. And here's another in, in instances of interfaces. Check this out. It's an I enumerable person. Well, how do I fill that? Well, I enumerable, list, linked list, arrays, they all implement I enumerable. So I can pass in almost any collection object into this. I can pass right. in a, a C sharp array. I can but pass it, in a But it does narrow list. down what you're able to pass in. Right. But if I didn't have this I enumerable, then I couldn't call link on it because link requires right. that this implements i enumerable mm -hmm. because link uses the functionality that i enumerable exposes to do its magic but yeah go ahead and go ahead and finish um what you're typing there because okay. i th i think i have a, a good way to help zach get this in just a second too actually I'm, I'm gonna break this out i would normally actually under normal circumstances this would all be one line of code but um i'm gonna break it out for zach No, that's not a bad thing or or a kick because No 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 no. I I'm fine with it. No no I didn't mean that bad. I hope you didn't take it like that. No, that's fine. That's fine. I did. <laughs> Trust me, no, no. sitting around here as the odd man out who doesn't program, I've had to develop a pretty thick skin when it comes to comments like that. No, no, I, I just meant that um, because we're actually we're not just writing code; we're explaining the code. Right, I understand. I'd be good. And be actually, I was I was going to ask, but there wasn't a time for me to get a word in edgewise as to at what point are you going to define the random list that we're going to be drawing from? And now you're finally oh, doing yeah, yeah. it. So, and I'm passing it into the constructor. 
Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you see that people is an array. Mm-hmm. So it's a person, a bracket, bracket. So it's an array. An array implements I enumerable. Right. Which allows it to be passed in as this constructor. So it had an interface to begin with. Well, yeah, the 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 uh, the array does implement an interface. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so now I can go ahead and I'm actually going to create all these side by side, and then just not use the ones I'm not using. I'm going to delete these guys and. I'm going to choose which one of these guys I want to put in. I need one creator and one uh, printer. printer. So I'm going to pass in my random person creator as the creator, and I'm going to pass in my console printer as the printer. And then I'm going to create another service. I'm going to create a service two. It's going to do the same thing. The difference is that I'm going to pass in my console creator instead of my random person creator, mm-hmm. and then call this. So if I execute, make sure you this call code, service two at the bottom. I'll get an exception. And the reason I get an exception is I shouldn't have used single. I should have used first. For, uh, single throws an exception if there's not any. I don't know why I thought that it was single. All my code just vanished. That's amazing. Go back down to where you called your services. Okay, first. That's good. That You need first. You don't need single. Um, okay. It, 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 okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, there okay. you go. Service Thank two. you. <laughs> Sorry about that. No worries. So you see that it printed out Nelson Lake. Okay. Uh-huh. And now it's looking yeah, I... for inputs because that's the role of the console creator. Well, that's the second one. So right. I'm going to break this. Um... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I... I was Wait, right. I, was... <laughs> I just wanted to break it apart. Okay. See, now i got a different mm-hmm. person. Mm-hmm. One just gives you the result because it's drawing from a random, and the next one is fired, which is looking for inputs from the user. Yes. Now, here's my question for you. Okay. If we didn't have interfaces... How would you do what he's doing here? How would you set up a person service that could use the random person creator or the console creator? Because the the arguments that are defined in the signature of the method. I see what you're saying because service, service is the same thing both ways. Uh, it's doing the exact same job, and it, it's yes. going to need that same. Uh, level of data, that exact same kind of data, which is why you have the contract in the first place. Yeah, so if you didn't have an interface, how would you go about doing it? Well, uh, clearly it seems like you'd need something other than service. You'd have to rewrite the code that service provides now calling on something other than than console creator. Um, Yeah, you would have to write another implementation of of person service. Right. So you would end up with two different person services. Right, Uh, and I see that now. But, but like earlier on, it, it, that wasn't it, what what sunk that in was actually creating the second uh, instance in this case of the person uh, the person service, and that's why I was trying to give while Nelson was typing out all mm-hmm. the code, I was trying to give the the quick example of just relating things to WoW for you right, in your right. inventory. Some things are usable, some things mm-hmm. are not. But but they all have to run through the same inventory system. But the same yeah, this inventory yeah. system was written one time. Right. And if something there's is not usable, like a usable inventory and a non-usable inventory, yeah. <laughs> which would be awesome, by the way. <laughs> which inventory okay, would but, open? You see that this code is is really clean. I do. Like, I mean, I can read can, it if that's what you mean. And because we utilized the interface, we know that a contract was enforced. So we know that we are safe to call create person and we are safe to call print person because that behavior will exist on these two different objects. Meaning that we only need one class in the form of person service that does this job. Yes. Okay. Oh, I guess nobody can see me nodding my head. Yes. Yeah. Nobody can see you nod. I talk with my hands all the time and nobody ever can see that. (laughs) Okay. So that's, that's interfaces. I I mean, the screen a lot too. It's true. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead, Nelson. I cut you off. Uh, that's interfaces as far as their use. There's a lot of other instances where interfaces are important. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I don't know. Yeah, kind of. But actually, something interesting is I, I want to show something really fast. Um, you said this earlier, and then Jason corrected you because you weren't technically right, and I probably would have done the same. But now looking back, there is something that you said that was almost like, you know, it, it was it was actually spot on. And 
watch what I do. Watch, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to nuke everything. Okay. Except for the person service. All right. And I'm going to, instead of passing an interface, and this is going to be uh, just kind of off the wall. It doesn't really apply to OOP at the moment, but I just want to, you, you said something in the past, and I wanted to show you that you're actually kind of correct. Do you remember saying, what I said? Because I said a bunch of stuff since this video started. <laughs> you said that, uh, that uh, you either said that interfaces are kind of like delegates, or you said that delegates are kind of like interfaces. Oh, the, the two did seem relatable, at least at the first glance, but only because we had used the word contract, which I know we had used when we were discussing delegates. Right. So you can actually... Um, do that kind of with with functions or with delegates. So I can do a, a person creator. It's not going to be an iPerson creator because I deleted that interface, but it's going to be a func that returns a person. Right, and a func has a return type. And what was the one and, that didn't? Is it an action? Uh, action. Thank you. Yeah, I deleted my person's person class. You got so a little overzealous with the delete key, I think. I still need my, there we go. And then nuke all this stuff. So did you just hit undo so you could bring some stuff back? Yes. Okay, just making sure. Okay, so our creator is a func that takes the person uh, creator. We're just going to keep calling a creator. And then our printer is an action that prints a printer. Because it doesn't have a return type. Yeah, and this is actually going to seem particularly useless because all it's going to do is pass one into the other. <laughs> but, yeah, I just wanted to show you that, yes, there... Uh, sometimes it might be useful to think of interfaces as a single delegate, or at least an interface with a single method is kind of like a delegate. Okay, this is just where the, all the time it happens, programmers clash with... All right, do we, get, do we get to catch no, a clash I, on camera? I, I disagree, I was but that's, that's just me. <laughs> Well, uh, um, because because where where do they differ? Can you explain where they differ, and then I'll, I'll I can actually be the judge here. In I this mean, case. I see what Nelson's getting at, but an, an interface is is no, it's great. You play, the, I'll play the referee for a minute. You you tell me how they differ, and I'll tell you which one of you I think is right. Well, the delegate is just passing single functionality. Mm -hmm. up, it's passing a method over to do the work. Okay, that mm -hmm. matches a defined a signature. signature. Yeah, where an interface is going to be used to determine if the type of an object is that interface. And then if so, we know that that object would have whatever needs to be implemented available to us to call. And it could be a single method, mm -hmm. but that single method may work with other methods or God only knows what, because it's it's we're right, an object right. here. I, I mean, I can see the correlation between the two uh, but again, only because they they both kind of have that that signature contract thing going on. Because because basically, in terms of what they do, I can uh, I feel the difference. Oh yeah, because one's a method, one's an right. entire object. That right, exactly. State and behavior. It's a lot of code he's writing. Okay, so yeah, yeah, and I don't disagree with you, Jason. Um, Neither one of you seems to disagree with each other, and i got to tell you, I think that's boring. One no. of you should look over at the other one and no, say, you're I, wrong. I know Nelson disagrees with me, but you know how I am. I, yeah. I, I recognize that all programmers all argue about all other programmers. I know. It's great. And, and I've just accepted that as a teacher. To me, they're, they're two very different things. He, and, and I feel – here, I'll make you excited. I feel Nelson's bending the laws of, nice. of code to make an interface – Make, excuse me, a delegate act similar to an interface. And I don't disagree with that. It doesn't have the cage match feel I was hoping for, but I'll go with it. And for me, come on. Okay. <laughs> and, and I agree with you that I am, I am doing something that is completely different. He's bending the matrix. Basically. Yeah, I gotcha. I am bending it. But I do want to point out that before delegate, or not before delegates, before lambdas, um, you never really saw delegates being used for what they're being used for. And instead, people use interfaces where they shouldn't. So, for example, like you saw with our original videos, we had like a, uh, a, um, a, I think that was the first that was the first time we talked about interfaces where we had this this i i uh, person or i integer predicate interface mm -hmm. that had a single method called bool yeah. is valid or add to di list. Now you, you are we, bringing up a very good point, very solid point, and that's with people using interfaces where we are looking just for should be using delegates, just right. some functionality to be passed right. in. 
and, and I just kind of wanted to point out that in some instances, when it makes sense, this doesn't make sense. I would never write this code myself, and that's why I said I agreed with you, Jason. But I, I also thought that it was useful to bring this up just because there is an ambiguity between them. And you have to be careful about deciding if you really need an interface or if you really need to delegate. Yeah. It's, do you need just functionality? Sure, sure. Because they, they both, again, they, they have that contract verification functionality to them in and of themselves. And I can see that becoming confusing, which is why the question kind of popped up into my head anyway. But it, from what, I, what I'm gathering from the back and forth is that the idea of a delegate is to pass in functionality, functionality that could in turn be swapped out for other forms pass of functionality. Pass in a method, yeah. Right. Just, just take a, a, some method that could be swapped out and pass that into something where an interface is here to clearly define what type of object we, ha we are looking at right now so that... So that if we take it in, right. we know we know what we know what we have. So yes. that we don't we don't run into errors where we don't have you know the functionality we need because it's the wrong type of object. A, an interface alleviates that problem. Do I understand, or am I missing something? No, I think you're pretty much there. Okay. Yeah, it's it's about uh, delegates are about functionality, whereas interfaces are about identification objects, objects of state and behavior. Okay. All right. Or just state, or just behavior. Yeah. Ex yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> um. Yeah, so that's those are classes and interfaces. What do you know about? Uh, I'm actually bringing all that code back. I might need it later. Um, what do you know about uh, in, uh, inheritance? Uh, Let's watch me fail at typing in backwards. That's okay. okay I know the go. idea that uh, okay. And, I'm fine with just being wrong. I, I'm always the first guy to run up to the blackboard and write something down, even if I just end up drawing a smiley face for the amusement of all the other classmates. But generally, I think of inheritance as the ability to take the uh, a, a level of functionality into another class so that it can be augmented or added to. Um, and yeah. That, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, that's that's one of the uses for interfaces, or not interfaces. Inheritance. Uh, in Inheritance. And that's probably the one, one that I'm most common. familiar with. Now, I'm sure that there's other means to utilize it, but that's the one that always and sings to me the most. if you change your vocabulary around just a little bit, it'll fit with all the books you'll ever pick up. Your yeah. inheritance, the, the means of extending right. the class. And, I, and I've used the term extending with it before. I was... Yeah, I thought that's kind of what I said. I just you didn't did. actually use you the did. word extending. No, no, no. That's what I just said. If okay. You change it I, I had little... to go back and play it back. Sorry. No, you said added to add Right, right, right. I do want to say right now, and this is probably something, another thing that Jason and I disagree about, and there's a lot of stuff in design, oh, oh, oh design that people will disagree about depending on their, you know, past experiences or whatever, um, because obviously I work in, mostly in the web development, whereas Jason mostly works in games, um, so that's probably where a lot of our differences come in, if there are any, so I don't really like Interface or uh, inheritance very much, and that blows my mind because when I was no. first taught about it, I mean, it seemed like such a, an, an amazingly useful thing. But because I mean, just the idea of starting from a generic principle and extending that into something more specific. But why don't you like it? I'm interested. Well, I, let me let me just toss this out there really quick. I don't disagree with you on that, Nelson. A long time ago, before I started getting into design patterns and really thinking about software engineering, about the engineering of an application. I thought an interface, or excuse me, inheritance, was the greatest thing in the world. But like Apple, for example, when coding for, um, when using Cocoa, or coding for the, um, the iPhone, Cocoa Touch or, or something, they, they are heavy believers, of course, in MVC, but also make heavy use of the delegation pattern, where you could look at their classes as they're, they're well, they're generally not sealed off, but the class provides a bunch of delegates that you can hook into and provide functionality, but they don't want you extending their classes into a super version of their class that now does new functionality. So that, right. that's one example. So they, they give you all these little hooks. Is that just a form of control on their part? It's, 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 a, it's, mm. a, it's a design mentality okay. that keeps that class clean. It's, it's theirs. It's very specific exactly. at what it does. And your code is clean and very specific with what it does. It doesn't clutter up the fact that your code now is really part of their object, just a more expanded object. And I'm fine with exposing my own naivety if it means it gets cured in, in the long run, but it's just like when you, when you say it the way, the, the way that you said it, it sounds like the whole idea is to restrict the developer 
in order to maintain complete control over uh, what you're doing? Yes and no. Okay. And again, the it is about restricting the developer, but it's not a bad thing. Sure. Okay. And the reason it's not a bad thing is I have to come up and bring up some details about this random person creator. And uh, first of all, do you understand what this random person creator does? Kind of. Sure. Like, do you understand like how it contains private? Uh, fields. Yes. It takes in something as a construct argument, and then it performs an operation. Yes, I'm I'm down with all that. See, the cool thing about this is nobody cares about this code. Okay. Nobody like th- this is called. This is the implementation detail of this class. Nobody cares about this code. Nobody should care about this code. This code could hit a web service. This code could do whatever it wants to do, and that's its implementation detail. And the important des- principle of object-oriented design is that your implementation details are never exposed in any way. Now, when you give people access to inheritance, there is a possibility, and in theory, you can mitigate this possibility, but in practice, it happens all the time, where this inherited class gets get, uh, is given these implementation details of its parent class, And it has to work around these implementation details. And it's working kind of, you know, it just feels messy. You're you're getting your hands in in this parent class's stuff. You're messing around with its own private implementation details. You're not talking to its public interface. It's funny. The the language you're using really does kind of tie into that um, quintessential and I'll even dare say stereotypical Apple mentality of everything has to just be clean and pristine and it's like why they have white computers and tell me what you want the computer to look like not necessarily what it can do it's just, it's funny because it's like I, it's all those things that all of the the people who are uninformed hate about Apple it's almost like you're kind of saying that's how they program too <laughs> well no but it, that's generally good design though because you never want to expose or I don't want to say never but you pretty much always don't want to expose um, the implementation details of a class because that leads to messy things. Because what if you change the implementation of this class? Mm -hmm. Then any code that depends not on the interface, not on the public contract, but any code that depends on this part of this class is going to break. I actually see what you're saying. It was just a a point that came to mind that I thought was kind of funny. Sorry. Okay. Uh, but but yeah okay so that that's just that's kind of one of the reasons why I, I I dislike inheritance because it just exposes too many implementation details in practice now in theory you could make a perfectly awesome class that doesn't you know is perfectly awesome in every way but in practice you'll often inherit from classes and somehow break some other class like you know that you don't even know about because you somehow changed some implementation detail and everything fell apart. Okay. Did I, did I explain yeah, that very it, well? it does. Uh, no, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Uh, Jason? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just I'm soul-searching, trying to think of a, a different example. I'm going to go back to the providing hooks mm-hmm. for you to hook into, but you make your own class, mm-hmm. and now you're going to provide the functionality of how you want it to utilize this other class, which, while not sealed, you can think of it kind of like being sure. sealed. And as Nelson was saying, now the developer of this particular class can come back in at any time. He knows that these hooks, they, they have to remain. They're, mm-hmm. they're publicly exposed for other people to utilize. But he can change around the mechanics in his own class all day long, and it's not going to break anything mm-hmm. that, that you do. You, your class has been – your class is not his class with more junk in it. Right. You're just hooking in. Um, right. If that helps in. No, I I see I see where you're coming from. Okay. I I understand the point. It, it's just the in Nelson's first discussion just a few moments ago, mm-hmm. some of the language he was using it made it kind of sound like it's a really kind of closed minded idea of saying no 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 you guys just aren't allowed to touch this leave it alone because it's perfect as it is. Even even with Apple stuff in their APIs, yeah, they're going to tell you to to take advantage of these delegates, mm-hmm. but they they say. You can still extend the class, mm-hmm. but we recommend that you don't. Mm-hmm. May, take advantage of these public delegates that are out these there. These hooks. These hooks yeah. that you provide the functionality. So then in their code, they just simply say, hey, if Zach has provided functionality for this, execute just feed it. feed it in, you, right? Use it. Do yeah. the thing. Exactly. And it I, I, honestly, um, and I, I never knew how much I really liked that mm-hmm. until I started developing on the, uh, the, uh, the whole iOS right. uh, platform. It, it, it's really nice because you keep your code separated from all of their stuff. Mm-hmm. 
and it, it's just it's it is and clean. you kind of always know what to expect it, no matter the project it's clean it's simple I, I like it personally. And mm -hmm. then I started developing with the MMO stuff that we were doing with Unity. With doing the, MMO the same tech. thing. I started doing the same thing, getting away from inheritance and just providing delegates that were going to say, all right, if you want to hook in here right. and take advantage of this having occurred, right. do so. So, but I mean, is that to. kind of like taking your, your master class and just kind of defining in advance what it can and can't do? I mean, to a certain degree, uh -huh. just to by, by allowing these, these hooks – I mean, are, is that what you're doing? Is just saying you're you're kind of laying out some really generic base functionality that can or can't be used? Not functionality, um, but extensibility points. Okay. All right. I'll go with that. And, and I'll say kind of mm -hmm. with the functionality part. Um, as in if um, – I'm, I'm just searching for examples. Like if you were to take a table view mm -hmm. and utilize their table view to populate it with data and handle what happens when scrolling and all of that good stuff, sure. instead of extending their table view, you hook in to these different things. So obviously these delegates have to get called. They right. have to get invoked. Right. But um, So that functionality, that base framework's all in place. Mm -hmm. And then it's your job to provide the actual implementation of what happens when these delegates when are When that invoked. delegate is called. If you even want right. something you, to happen. If you even want to use it. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully that was okay. that all right with you, Nelson? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I hope we didn't scare anyone away from inheritance, but I usually avoid it. But there are, there are instances that I, I can't really think of an instance right now where I've recently used inheritance for any reason. Um... Yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, I, I have to use it in some instances in ASP.NET MVC, but that's because that's what they that's what they tell you to yep. do in certain instances. Well, it's, it's like you know, all mo a lot of my um, experience in terms of of inheritance kind of comes from working with the Unreal Engine, where you you know you start off with oh. at, the, at the level of an <laughs> I know, I know, I know, but but hang on, try to keep your size and your your I don't know regurgitation to yourself. <laughs> But it's okay. But you start off at the, the base level of actor, which is just some object that can be in your scene, and then you start inheriting from that various classes, which in turn inherit from other classes, and you, you eventually get yourself down to an item. What's the problem with that? Okay, okay, okay. You you want you want to bring up using this sort of architecture in context of games? Great. Nelson's like, okay, okay. You want to fight? You want yeah, to fight? that's that's what I heard, and that's fine. It's like, no, I don't want to fight. I was just asking a simple question. Let's do it. <laughs> But I mean, if if that okay. if that starts a fight, awesome. That's entertaining. Okay, so hold on. So then, let's say that actually we want to have lightable. Okay. Is renderable. And then a box is renderable. A box right? is lightable. Oh, okay, fine. My box is lightable. I mean, if you're going to do this this downward step cascading thing, yeah. <laughs> okay, so then we have... Um, hold on, let me come up with... I had this in my mind a second ago, but now I'm failing. Oh, don't to... fail, because a second ago you had determination in your I know, heart. dude. It was just like, all right, come on. We are starting a cage match right, now. On, I got my on. steel I, chair. I know, how to, I know how to inspire him again. Zach, start talking about how awesome the whole... Hierarchy. Well, I mean, it did make for, sense to me. I mean, I, I could glance at the hierarchy just like in an instant, know exactly what I could and couldn't place, and and know the roles of everything. But so, so right, what's the real problem with that? Let me think of it. The inst the problem is, is when you have. Um... I also know that if I want to code something in Unreal Script, I can start off by inheriting one of the existing classes, and I already have all of its functionality, which makes it real easy for me to modify some of it or add on my existing, my own functionality, and now I've just created a new weapon or a new vehicle or anything yeah. I like, and it was really easy. <laughs> okay, well, I had a great example in my head a second Don't tell me I won the cage I match. Really did. Oh, I no, really did. No. I really did. Okay, Jason, help me out here. You know what I'm getting at, though. No, you when were you writing these things down, and, uh, you know. <laughs> it's like, you, hang see, on. Because, like, what, right, what, right now, I know you started off saying that this is going to be a bad example, but it's like, great, doesn't this mean I could write my own class called Sphere, and that would also be lightable, and now that actually works? But, but with the implementation of, let's say, a weapon class in Unreal, which extends, 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 right? So yeah. then, let's say we're down at a weapon class. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so we do, like, a... Oh, um, uh... <laughs> Don't lose it now, Nelson, because I was, I was, I was going to give it a stab. 
Okay, so a uh, weapon is lightable, I guess. Sure, just like a box, but apparently. Let's say we have an ammo weapon. So let's, let's say we have two children of weapon, an ammo weapon. We have an ammo weapon, and then we have a uh, energy weapon. Okay. Is this something you would see in... I mean, okay, I, I don't, I don't code in Unreal script either. I mean, I'm just familiar with the concept, but sure, sure, let's go with it. Fine. Well, I, I still don't see the problem yet. I think I'm except your spelling. Yeah, there should be an A after the E on both of those. Yeah, yeah. I bet I say too. That's okay. No worries. Hold on. Okay. Yeah. All the that's a terrible color. I hate that color. Um, Isn't that vaguely okay, so the have... color of the background on your computer? <laughs> anyway, so we have. Ammo weapon, and then let's say we have a rocket launcher, Ooh. or let's say we have a projectile weapon, or no, go, use, go use, with, use rocket launcher. Go with a rocket That's launcher. That has such an unreal feel to it, anyway. Yeah, keep it simple. Which would have to inherit from ammo weapon. Yes, but now let's say we have an energy weapon that behaves exactly like a rocket launcher, but it's an energy rocket launcher. Okay, what balls of energy that travel forward, kind of like a rocket? Yeah, but now what do we do? I guess that would depend on the functionality that was already inherent to energy weapon. But but see, though, it, it's a both an energy weapon, weapon and it's a form of rocket launcher. So if we were working with an ammo weapon, we would just make another extension on rocket launcher. Sure. But because we're wanting to write an energy weapon version, we're now having to think about do which one do we inherit from? Because bo neither of them really make sense. Right, okay. It, it doesn't fit in either one is what you're saying. So... I mean, okay, so it's maybe a little more work on my part, but why can I so, not just go up to the level of weapon and inherit from that and build my own? Because then you're re-implementing re all the functionality and you just defeated the purpose. But there, was, but there wasn't any proper functionality to define a weapon that was both energy-based and projectile, so now I need to create that. What's the problem? No, no, no. Hell, I could I could open up both of like ammo weapon and energy weapon, probably take the best of both worlds and how the code was approached and use that as a basis to create a third class called energy ammo weapon. And then I could inherit from that my my energy rocket launcher. What is the problem? That's disgusting. <laughs> there well, you go. You hit the nerve. All right. Good job. You're sitting about you're sitting here like talking about copy and pasting code, creating a bunch of classes, inheriting from all this stuff, and that is exactly what leads to bad design. Because then you get in positions like this where you want something of one class and you want something else of another class. But because you're using inheritance, you have no way to get both. I mean, is this somehow f coming back to elitism on some form? Because it seems like it would still get the job no. done. No, no, no. This is about coming back to less code, more readable, more understandable, and more extensible. And that's about object-oriented design. And if you want to call Here, design but here's an, elitist, There's an interesting thing about that. Okay, I, I already see the direction you're going. But there's an interesting thing about that if, if you look into it because I was already able to take a look at this hierarchy and it had tremendous readability. And you and I both, by talking for just a couple of seconds, were able to see immediately that the hierarchy we saw didn't have the functionality that we needed. And so we saw the point at which in the hierarchy we could add in the functionality that we needed in order to get our, our necessary result. How is that bad and how is that unreadable? It's bad and unreadable because now we have a, a, a energy ammo weapon or whatever, an energy ammo weapon rocket launcher thing. You're, just, you're, you're sitting here creating classes. You, you don't have any rules. You don't have any structure. You, you're... I'm not following you because the goal was – you started off by saying what if you need – a weapon that is like an energy weapon and also a rocket launcher. And I'm not and saying that you can't. You that's can't how you do started that. by saying, what, but, if, "What if we need uh, this kind okay. of weapon in our game?" That's all I'm saying. And it, it seems like, and, and I'm fine with you saying that you don't like this this inheritance method. That's great, Nelson. That's not a problem at all. I'm just saying the example we've used so far hasn't illustrated to me why it's a bad thing. See. I could have used while true, but I didn't. I don't even know what you did. So you're you're trying to to equate the whole thing with a go-to <laughs> statement? Yes. In its in its simplest form, Zach, does a weapon, if we were to abstract the concept of a weapon to just that, a generic weapon, mm -hmm. does it have very specific no. functionality? No. No. Weapons, that, that's that's but that, that would be its whole nature. Can't be fired. 
Okay, no, what? That's what I'm, that's I need, what I'm okay, looking you, for. Okay, you said if it's Abs generic, is it specific? No, I'm, I'm abstracting its functionality back to what would be considered its base functionality. What kind mm -hmm. of functionality would you expect to find in Nelson's example here inside the weapon class? Uh, something that can be held, can cause damage, can be fired. Okay. So, um... Can be stored in your inventory. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be swapped uh, to you know you can you can you know load it into the screen and load it out of the screen. So if you were, if you create it using like a delegation pattern, mm -hmm. you could create your own weapon mm -hmm. that is going to basically hook into an instance of weapon mm -hmm. and provide an implementation for if it's fired, if it's. Um, reload it so you're now in just a single class you're defining just how your rocket launcher works now let's say now you got your energy weapon we don't have to have another class like in this case how he had ammo weapon extends a uh, weapon mm -hmm. and we have energy weapon extends weapon we don't have to have those breaking down in this hierarchy coming together now it stays flat we say sure. now let's make an energy weapon so our energy weapon is going to utilize a it's weapon it's still a weapon it just uses different functionality to get you different you results you define the functionality right. so when you look in your your different uh, weapons mm -hmm. um, you, you're not having to worry about what weapon are what weapon type are we implementing so i know is it going to be an energy or is it going to be ammo Instead, you, you just look focus your on the functionality. You, there you yeah. go. You see just your code for what happens when I fire, what happens when I reload, what happens when I... Nelson, why didn't you just say that? Well, so does that make it... Actually, yeah, sense? no, I, I see what you're saying, because now you can just have one weapon class so you don't and then this, redefine the functionality as you go. You don't get this crazy hierarchy of all these different classes, and then you come in and you're going to use this to define this new weapon now you got to decide all right where do i want to extend this from now and also nelson i i don't mean to make you like chew glass or anything in the background but i was playing slightly devil's advocate because i hate the actor classes browser in unreal <laughs> where would that even come from zach <laughs> and nelson's like too late his mouth's already bleeding. He's <laughs> chewed his tongue off well, no, it, it, it can be hard to find the things that you're looking for, and I understand that. But, I mean, with the example that we started with here, I really wanted to make sure that I got across that, I mean, some people do kind of utilize this, and it has been established, oh, yeah, and it doesn't didn't... necessarily mean that it's bad, so I really wanted to, to see if somebody could show me how bad it was. I still don't see how it relates to a go-to statement, but okay. <laughs> yeah, I, Nelson, you got me on that one. I. It's just, it's, well, no, it's, it's, it's just like, the Do you see this? This is bad, and so is the hierarchy, so there! It's just like all of a sudden you randomly said, yeah, yeah, well, you're ugly. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, no, no, no. What I meant by this go-to statement is I, I kind of had to get into there are multiple there are multiple levels of object-oriented design. You have to know your audience. And if your audience is a group of programmers, then you want to design it with, you know, obviously with good pro programming practice. That makes it easy for the programmers who have the knowledge to work with your code. And if your target is if a bunch of kids who may want to mod games, then it might be a good idea to have it a little easier to, to get from one thing to another. Right. And we understand that go-to statements are bad as programmers. Yeah. But non-programmers might not. I see what you're saying. It might seem like... It, it, it might see why would you I get to play Zach. Why, why that, that's it, not quite as bad as doing not, the six well, steps to Kevin Bacon. Hang or on, I get to play Zach, and I really do get to play Zach. Oh, okay. but Nelson, I love go tos. What's what's the problem? You're just telling it to go back up to the top. It's logic, straightforward, black and white. What's wrong with that? <laughs> oh boy, he did short circuit. Yeah, exactly. He's going to start trying to define <laughs> okay, spaghetti okay, okay. code on a video. The problem with go tos is that it breaks the flow of your method. You don't know where that label is going. And if you need a go-to, that probably means your code is really big or your method is really big. And if your method is really big then, and you have go-to's because you only needed go-to's because your method is really big, then it follows that those go-to's are probably going to be off the screen somewhere. And you're going to have no idea where your method is. And if you have a method that's longer than a normal screen, and this isn't a normal screen, by the way, because uh, we're in a low resolution. Yeah, I was going to actually but if you have a method, Yeah. If you have a method that's longer than that, then you should – think about breaking it apart and if you break it apart then things like go to's don't matter because your code is no longer as convoluted because yeah, chances are you are already breaking the single responsibility principle you're breaking the principle of <laughs> of not writing. using go to's <laughs> you're breaking the principle of my face that's right <laughs> okay and i'm about um, to break the principle of your never mind <laughs> jason actually did describe a, a really good way to uh to 
re-implement that object graph with the with the delegation. And um, I actually wasn't thinking about that, but uh, that's that is a good method for a lot of instances. Especially, you'll see that with Windows Forms and uh, WPF as well. Well, it was interesting because I mean, I I wanted to uh, to just I wanted to at least get across that while digging through a really complex hierarchy with a whole bunch of objects does prove to be interesting and difficult if you know what you're looking for, but you're not exactly sure what it inherited from, so you're having to dig down through all kinds of stuff. I, I understand that that can be a pain. But on a really fundamental level, it makes sense to a degree, and what I wasn't seeing right off the bat was why that was bad versus something else. And then the cool thing about Jason's example was it made it clear that you could just define some really basic functionality that you could just leave hooks into, and then leave the right. details of that functionality up to the developer so that, yeah, you know all weapons are going to fire and cause a certain amount of damage. Or you and could say all weapons have a primary, a secondary. Yeah, uh, sure, or sure. Or can sure. have. Maybe yes, they have. the developer right. doesn't, in their own class, decide to take advantage of the hook or the delegate for a secondary fire, mm -hmm. then the weapon just doesn't have a secondary fire. Right. But now, before anybody out there that's listening to this video goes, ah, oh, gag, well, what if we need to do something a weapon's never been seen doing before like it needs a third dairy fire tertiary <laughs> yeah t well just yes. go with it the, the class you wouldn't seal the class off you could ex still extend the class sure and you could still add your own functionality in. sure but on the, and then only because you need to only because you're now going outside the scope of right. what has been publicly provided in its interface right. for another developer to utilize i'm fine with that okay I don't necessarily see where the hierarchy bit is bad, but that's okay. It's bad. I, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, nested nested hierarchies are a pain, and they're bad. I, and, 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 and really, it, <laughs> I know that's just a, it's fine. Ridiculous hang on, thing hang on, to hang say. On. You do see where it's I bad. I do. Because in this example, mm -hmm. that well, oh, it all disappeared. I should yeah, he already nuked the example. In, in the example, if you're going to create a weapon, you have to stop ahead of time. You have to look through all of their no. different classes that it, uh, all break out from mm -hmm. weapon and decide which one best describes your weapon to start with instead of simply saying, okay, I, I'm going to provide my own, I'm going to provide this is how it fires, this is how it reloads, this is its secondary fire. It, it, instead, you've got to look for the right Sure, and, and a really good example of that would be like, be, be completely new to working with something like uh, like UDK or you know, the Unreal Engine 3, go into the editor and say you want to drop down a rocket launcher. I dare you, uh, because you're going to look, you, you got to start out at, at the placeable objects, and then you got to figure out what proper class it inherited from, which the original class is not called weapon. I don't even remember what it's called. But you've got to like dig down through all of these crazy names that just have nothing to do with your weapon until you eventually find the one that starts to work its way toward ammo and placeable objects and pick, well, pickups, and pickups goes into weapon, and then, then you find what you're looking for. And if that's any indication of what it's like to dig through the code, then I do see your point. Right, and um, in addition to what Jason was saying, um, you can actually go a step further, and I can describe or I can show how you would probably write this code for like maybe a rocket launcher. So you have a rocket launcher, sure. and it's a weapon, but it might be beneficial to um, to break it apart into its individual in uh, uh, individual uh, interfaces. So I inventory item and. Um, I holdable item. That's not how you spell holdable. Is holdable even a word? No, it's not. But actually, that's fine. Yeah, and should, when it comes to interfaces, yeah. dude, I do stuff like that all the time. Yeah, he does. Actually, I pick upable. Heck yeah. Yep. I, it was like, are, are you sure there's enough ables in that? Okay, so now you can. Um, I'm trying to think of the best way to do this, but for example, I inventory item would require that we have a uh, public property called name. Sure. You know, or a quantity, or yeah. Do it if you're not in a rush, and Zach's not in a rush. I'm make just make an interface real quick. Uh, oh come on, that's good stuff for people that are, especially people that are new to this concept. Because we are getting into design. Well, you guys this have finally, is, you guys have finally made interfaces made sense to me. So you got to be on some kind of a right track. And this is this is getting into design. Every it is sure. Um, let's just say... Do me a favor, though. Okay. Give me uh, give me a couple more things than just one... At least one more thing than just having one thing. If you really want to separate it from delegates, uh, give me a couple more things that have to be inside of each interface. At least one more thing, so it's not just one. 
Because you know you were talking about uh, the there is that really vague correlation, and I think part of that comes from just seeing one thing inside of it. So stretch it out a little bit. Awesome, thank you. I don't know. These are terrible. That, no, no, names. no. That, that's fine. But they're getting a point across. Um, I don't know what started use I, means, but yeah, I know what I don't put away. Throw this at Zach in um, in um, the WoW or not WoW, but in our MMO sure, tag. Sure, sure, sure. Um, if something was an inventory item, mm -hmm. it had to have a name. Mm -hmm. It has to have an ID, and it has to have a count. Right. How much can it be stacked? Like a stack count. Sure. Those things are absolutely required on mm -hmm. every single thing. So that's three things that would be in that particular interface. I'm basically. fine with that. Uh, let's just go ahead and uh, I don't know. This is all this is all terrible, terrible names. But uh, user key key. Yeah, let's just do that. User input. Eh. Sorry, user key sounds like a serial code to me. Um, actually, let's just let's just break this out into three interfaces. Um, let's just do. Okay, so now we have all of our public interface for this. And now we can use something called composition. That chair is just going to explode. That chair scares the daylight out of me when it does to... that. i got to find out how to make that stop. Sorry, guys. <laughs> okay, so you following me, Zach? So far? So you understand the interface that we have been implementing? The I inventory, I holdable, I respond to input? Yes. And see, I love to say this. If you instantiate rocket launcher... You know that it is an I inventory item. Yep. It is an I holdable item. And it you know it has to have all of these things in it. Mm -hmm. And this is this is it, actually for the first time ever. This is starting to explain how you're getting away from inheritance. Yes, but see now here's the thing where people are like, oh inheritance. Um, what if you already have a weapon implemented that has its own takeout and put away stuff? I wish you would have let you just stayed in that voice because it was time. awesome. That for was a the second. best voice wow, ever. How are you going? <laughs> that was awesome. Sorry. But but that's what that's what a person a, a proponent of uh, of inheritance would say would say this rocket launcher now has to re-implement every single functionality of a weapon and so but, well, how do well, we how I'll do we do with that? Well, doesn't it? Well, it does. Yeah, but it doesn't have to. Wait, no, you just said it does have to, and it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, I, lo I love responding with that. Like, it just yeah. I know, I know. Okay. It satisfies some innate need. Now explain yourself. <laughs> Composition. The the last or the second to last thing on our list, or actually the third thing we've already covered, but we'll recover it in a second. Composition is where that we list was like two hours ago. What's composition? <laughs> okay, composition. Example of composition is this random person creator. Okay, he's a composite of people and random. Okay, all right. Well, he's more of a composite of people. Random is implementation detail. All right. So. We can go ahead and say that this rocket launcher has its own little its own little weapon helper class. I guess you could say the weapon that Jason was describing. Mm -hmm. And then we could just delegate back off into takeout would be weapon dot takeout, and then put away it would be weapon dot put away, and so on. Now, and we could we could also use inheritance here. Can I? I mean, I I, I have an, uh, it may be an alarmingly stupid question. I have no idea. I'm just going to throw it out there anyway. If you have a really killer tool like ReSharper and you start off by defining a class that's implementing X number of interfaces, if those interfaces are already there, is there not some way to get it to go ahead and see the things that you need and drop them in for you? Oh, you mean like that? Yeah, exactly like that. Okay, that, that's all I wanted to see because <laughs> I was just like, you know, if you can gripe to the cows come home that, oh, don't you have to implement all this stuff now? It's like, yeah, but aren't there tools since that should be automatable? Yeah. Okay, so we have our weapon, and then now we can delegate onto this weapon because we're now a composite of this weapon. But th this, I, I, I'm torn because you could still use inheritance here. To extend the weapon to have like a third form of firing, that sort of thing? Well, I mean that you could in, in, inherit from Rocket Launcher from Weapon, um, but you can also 
just delegate it to it through composition. And most of the time, this will be preferable because, well, it invo- avoids inheritance. But, um, but yeah, so you do something like this, and then you construct it in a way that Jason was describing, or you just put in your own implementation details. Like, it doesn't matter. Anything, anything goes in here, and that's the important part of this architecture, is that on input, anything goes. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you're not restricted because if we if we had a base weapon class or whatever, we would be uh, restri- uh, we would be restricted to whatever that whatever it does before and after. We would be restricted to its own implementation details. But in this case, we're just delegating back to this weapon and then performing all of our additional code. Or we don't even have to have delegate like this. We could just say on input if key dot key hit equals I don't know f then weapon.fire. You know what sure. I mean? So I and but that, I would for using like delegation pattern, I, I would do it a little bit different in design as opposed to and, and Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I remember you were you're saying that you would instantiate a weapon object and then add the delegates to that the, kind the, of the, the other way. Yeah, around. the the weapon would already be doing the call outs. If within the what the inside the weapon class itself would be the delegates. And then it would know when these things need right. to be triggered because when a person de- defines their left mouse button as fire, it's fire for all weapons in sure. Unreal. Sure. Okay. So if someone hit the left mouse button, the functionality is already there, but then it would simply say, okay, um, if my delegate for this instance of weapon, if my delegate's been defined, which would be then in your class that's using this weapon, right. then call on that functionality. And this keeps from us doing callbacks into weapon, mm-hmm. but instead we define what would happen for takeout. We define what happens with put away. We define what happens for on input. Right. So, I mean, you're saying the it, weapon would fire on left mouse just by its own very nature, no matter what weapon it is. Correct. And then you're going to you have a you're delegate. Just gonna define what happens when that, when that fire is called. Yeah, you have a de- delegate that you can point towards one of your methods for how to handle that fire. Sure. Right. And that, that's one way to do it. And that would, that might be more, that might be better for this instance, particular instance, this example. Mm-hmm. However, the reason why I came up with this in the first place was what if we want weapon to extend and implement another interface? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like what if we want to add an additional interface to weapon with your, uh, w- with your example, you would have to subclass weapon or extend it. And then implement that interface. And you could. Would you? I mean, yeah, you could. It, it would be an acceptable solution. Um, both of these ways, they're good for their own merits. You know what I mean? It, for this particular example, now that Jason has been talking, maybe that might be a better solution for this instance. Well, no. What, what I was, I'm sorry. What I was going to ask was, I mean, does it – would you absolutely have to create a brand new weapon if you just wanted to implement another interface? You would have to extend from it. You'd have to create, you'd have to do um, another extension. And then you'd have to extend, extend from, from weapon. And then also now extend from another extension or whatever. This is how you would be able to provide another interface to weapon or this weapon. So, no, that's not what I was getting at. Because, like earlier, the code said, okay, it was rocket launcher implements three different uh three right. different interfaces is there a rule that says that rocket launcher couldn't have implemented a fourth no 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 no, no. Oh, that was that was an instance yeah my example you could implement as many implement interfaces well, as that's you. what i thought I, I was going back to jason's example where he was talking about having a weapon that had all the behavior and everything in a weapon and then called out when it needed to do, do something mm-hmm. and it, it depends on what you're writing and I think but that even, probably even in this example, I guess that's why I'm I'm quiet because I'm having a little bit of a hard time seeing why you'd have to do it like this. Because if you're adding new functionality, anyways, the rocket launcher already knows that it has a weapon, that it is a weapon. Um, right. So so why couldn't you just tack that functionality on in rocket launcher itself? Because you got the functionality has got to be added somewhere. Whether you're going to extend weapon and add it there, or you can implement an interface that says, hey. Anyone that has this interface has to have this functionality and then just add that new functionality straight to Rocket Launcher. Well, which example are you talking about? Mine or yours? With the za- example I was talking about. Cause the weapon's, because the weapon's you- concrete. It has, it has 
five, six things right. that will always happen, period. Any functionality that you want to add on to that, why couldn't you do it in that particular weapon? Oh, okay, because if you wanted for any other reason for another weapon class to in- implement another interface, like let's say your previous weapon class didn't respond to a certain hook in the framework and didn't, didn't have a certain interface implemented and you wanted it to be used in a different way, you would have to create another class Extend from weapon and then extend from your other interface. Can I get what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I see what you're saying. So if weapon implements interface 1, 2, and 3, or sorry, I1, I2, I3, um, and you wanted to implement I4, you're going to have to subclass it and add that implementation. Yeah, I, I, that, that sounds like you're coming back to a rule about the number of uh, interfaces you can possibly extend. No, no, I'm, I'm operating I'm under the assumption. I, I'm operating under the assumption that you can't edit the base weapon class. Okay, all right. Is what I'm saying. All right, because you may you might break another weapon that's already been pulling from it. No, you can't physically type the code into that class. Right. Okay. But and, and right. I'm I guess I'm still going off of if you just tacked on that other interface to your rocket launcher, you could have done the implementation in there and just left weapon only doing its very small handful of things, period. So do you mean still using, you, you mean doing something like this? Yeah. Except, okay, no, no, so no, you... except rocket launcher is not going to inherit or extend weapon. It, okay. it would have, you could even have its constructor take a weapon in. And then that's our, our base framework that we could then use to tie to the, our own local instance of a weapon to tie into all of its delegates. And then if we needed to add additional functionality on top of that in the way this, again, I'm now dealing with a very concrete object. This, this rocket launcher works. We could just add that functionality in right here. Right, but where would the, implementa- where would be the object of, of weapon be coming from? Whoever instantiates the rocket launcher, yeah. or actually, no, you don't even have to do that um, because it it could just instantiate its own. Yeah, weapon. that's kind of what I had going right here, where it instantiated its own weapon right, and then right. just passed into its own it it basically took these interfaces and then mapped it i I guess map i could say map to uh this weapon class is kind of what i'm saying i'm I'm with you (laughs) okay so yeah so that's that well good example or bad example um, it is an example i like it (laughs) so what it's an example either way yes it's an example um like i said i don't really work in game development too much or at all. So I do web development, and generally I haven't had to model a rocket launcher or a <laughs> weapon before. So I really haven't thought about you this until like lived right the second. Yeah, I'm so definitely going to pull you into the MMO stuff because that's going to be a, an absolute blast. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm more about entities and, uh, you know, domain objects and boring business stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, so that actually brings us to another... Okay, there's three more terms we have to define so, so, until... Again, I'm playing Zach. So, okay. composition. You've said it a few times. Clearly define it in a, a sentence for me. I tried to infer it already from what he was saying, and you can just tell me if I'm right, and if I'm wrong, that's great. I'd rather be wrong and know how. Um, I wrote down, because I'm taking notes like a fiend over here, it says, um, a means of identifying the aspects that make up or compose a particular class. Hmm... Kind of. Okay, then then give me a definition so that I can augment it. Uh, composition is about a object, well, <laughs> composing another class. <laughs> I know, it's awful. That's um, fine. It's about... Hmm, it... Uh, it's hard to explain because it, this is an example of composition because we're composing this people object in this class, and that's what we're using. And we're composing this random. Uh, yeah, this is this is an example of composition um, because implementation details are what the composition is about. 
because we're delegating. This is another instance of decoupling and delegation. We're delegating the responsibility of creating random numbers. All right, hang on though. Hang on. This random hang object on though. If if this is composing this and this is composing that, then how is I don't know this not composing create person? No, no, no. Uh, this entire class is composing these two. But composition refers to the objects that the class relates to, not the behaviors that it exposes. Okay. See, this relates to random and I enumerable a person. Not publicly. It's an implementation detail. But it still delegates the responsibility of, um, of creating random numbers to random. And it delegates the responsibility of containing people to this person or this people class or object. I'm still not you know sure I, mean? I follow. I mean, I'd love to just say yes so we can move on, but I, I just don't think I follow. Is there any <laughs> any help here, Jason? Um, I don't know. Take the you follow the shoe method, where you just keep hitting someone in the head with a shoe until they get it. Take okay. another stab at okay. saying it again. Maybe this time something will stick. Composition is about. Taking, Don't tell me what it's about. Tell me what it is. Composition is taking a bunch of objects and composing a more advanced object on top of it. How, and, and how are you doing that here? Well, look at it. Because look at what is a, a random person creator. It is a, a class that will create a person. I was hoping to get Nelson to tell me. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll be quiet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, this this is an this is a class and it's delegating to other classes it it it's a complex class think about it like that like this class has multiple components mm -hmm. to it it has the people and the random and those are mul multiple things that are they're objects within this object are you basically saying that the, the fields form the composition of a class the fields and properties yes and is that, that are, it that are pointing to other Objects, other classes. Other objects that form more complex objects. So not like objects. an int x equals 12, and that's you know a private field you're going to have in there. So not like an int, is that what you just said? Right. right. Um, okay. It's got to point to another class it's, it's to be considered where part you're of the using composition. Multiple classes to compose. Mm -hmm. A random person creator right. has to have these other classes, these other objects instantiated. They're, they're being utilized. They're, they're required for this. But see, here's the neat thing. The random person creator, the people who use this, the... Com the consumers of this class don't care that it needs a random. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's encapsulated, which is a, the other term. But um, the the random, it's basically a more complex class. It's a higher order class. It's a class that uses classes. Sure. So if you had a very simple car, and that simple car had tires and engine, seats, radio, but you just said, give me a car and go to set some stuff. That car is a complex class because it contains all of these other objects in it. So the composition of a class are the fields and properties that require instances of other classes. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. I mean, you probably think that's kind of stupid to define that term. No, that's, but... I mean, if really at this stage of the game, it's it's like okay, if if we need it, if or if it's something like where somebody's going to ask me later on, what is the composition of this class? I at least like to know what it is I'm going to be looking for. Okay. What's the composition of the car class? Well, it's got an engine, it's got tires. I, I would say, show me the code, and I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Smart Alec. <laughs> okay, so composition, and the last thing is polymorphism. And we already have an example of polymorphism here. Uh, polymorphism means, or literally means, many forms. Mm -hmm. And it means that... And you'd have it actually, here in the form of your uh, your console person creator versus your random person creator? No, he, he was actually pointing to, at least I believe he was pointing to the right line. What are you talking about? He was talking to you. Uh, well, right line has... Well, go ahead. Go ahead, Nelson. I, I... We are okay. Yeah, go back to what you were saying. We already have an example of polymorphism here. Please continue. Polymorphism is about uh, it, well, it's no, it's like what you said—the many forms of of an I person or I console service or whatever whatever we call those guys. No, implicit you got at least tell win. me. Yeah, like I said, implicit typing for the win. I don't get <laughs> very 
type names. Um, I, I personally create. You know, I just saw a story on the news today that whatever has actually been voted once again as the most annoying word in the English language. Oh, wow. Interesting. Just so you know that, Nelson. How do you mean? Never mind. Uh, is there anything you wanted to add? Um, yeah, you said we had an example of polymorphism right here, but you never completed that. And then you said what polymorphism was all about. So start more simply by telling me what polymorphism is. Okay. Uh, we, we have an example of polymorphism. We have the, the console printer, which has two forms. It has a console, a console person printer and, I, and an I person printer. But what is polymorphism? You, you've told me what it's about and you say we've got an example here. Can you tell me what it is? It's about change. That sounds like a commercial. <laughs> it's, about <change. laughs> it, it, it's about using the same object in multiple contexts, ah. depending on which type you're working up with. Okay. And, and that's kind of a bad example of polymorphism, to be honest. But um, is there any better way you can explain that, Jason? Oh boy, we could get into a, a very <laughs> lengthy discussion on polymorphism. Well, it's it's. I mean, and I I hope changing the way behavior mm -hmm. occurs. Okay. We have the ability to change the way that behavior occurs. Okay. Right. And it is kind of uh, it, the 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 examples seem superficial because we're I mean we're talking about interfaces. We usually just yeah. cast that person into this interface. But here, let me show you. Let me show you something else. A lot of the initial examples are superficial. So that's not a problem. Yeah. Let me show you something that'll blow your mind. Okay. Oh, those are the best. Yeah, my favorite actually. And we're just going to yank this and then delete this guy. And whether or not this is particularly good note code would be uh, up to what you're solving or what problem you're, is, is at hand. Uh, because of SRP, I would generally recommend against um, doing something like this. Mm -hmm. However, at the same time, he exposes both of what he does in a form of interface. Okay. In the form of, of two interfaces. So we can use this same class in these two instances. So let's go ahead and delete all this stuff and do... So now we can pass it into both. Because he implements both interfaces. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, it's a bad example again because it's it's not something that I would recommend even well, doing. Well, let me let me just throw and, this out there. And I mean, I know you. I've asked you a couple of times, and each time you say, "Well, we've got an example here," or polymorphism is about this. But well, I'm, I'm I, surprised. I'm just going to add this real quick, and then let Nelson just chew on it. I'm surprised that sure. he hasn't talked about virtual and override because they require an, an uh, inheritance, and we just I <laughs> talked about I how know, but don't it, preclude the, that I, sort of thing. If it helps your example, don't narrow your thinking down to what you can and can't do. You know, you could. You how could about just... Nelson? How about to string? Eh, okay. I mean, that keeps you from having to go and define inheritance. Well, and all. what I was hoping for yeah. was just something that I could say. All right, if I if I was writing notes and I actually wrote down the term polymorphism space hyphen space. What sentence can I follow that hyphen with to define polymorphism for my notes? Because that is exactly what I'm doing right now. That's where I'm sitting. Now, I can go look it up on Google after the video if it comes to that, but I was hoping you could tell me something. Okay. Uh, I have this class object, and there already is a class object in the uh, .NET framework, mm -hmm. but I'm just showing you what it would look like if all we had was the two-string method on sure. Now, object has this two string, and this is what it looks like in the um, in the uh, where it's actually defined. Mm -hmm. And every single object, every single class in .NET, every single type actually in .NET, including enumerations and delegates and everything, they all implement or inherit from object. Okay. And object provides this virtual string two string method. So this is actually the same code. Sure. Sure, because it's kind because of implied. implied. Yeah. yeah. And so we can go ahead and here and say, we can say public override, mm -hmm. because we're going to override the two-string method, which is right there. Okay. And then you can see there's the equals and the get hash code. Mm -hmm. We can override that, and then we can do our own functionality. So we're going to do...
But as a, do me a, a favor after you do that. Yeah. Um, comment that out and go ahead and oh. comment that whole oh, okay. method out. Yeah, okay. And then where and you then at, show. Yeah, actually show that two string does currently function. That it does something. That it has, yeah, it has function. Yeah, it has an. Um, sorry, my brain's going kind of crazy. It's all good. Um, You're fine. <laughs> yeah, this is. It's late. Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> Okay, so here's here's that the person dot two string, and that is implied because it's from object. You see object dot two string. You see that when mm -hmm. I hover yep. over it, it shows me that's object dot two string, but we don't have it implemented there anymore because it's common to die. Yeah. So so right now, if he runs it and put some stuff in, all right. Now you're gonna have to go ahead and put a uh, yeah, 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 a, yeah, yeah a weight in there. Key the action. Now, go ahead and tell them what that's showing. Okay, this is the uh, type name of this object. Mm -hmm. So you see right here we have person.toString. Yeah. Person is of type person. Right, and then it, you, it's actually reporting back the namespace of the program. Yeah, including the namespace. This is, this is a, it's the, uh, the, I think it's the full name attribute on the type object that this is what it's pulling from. But anyway... That's using reflection to get the whatever class that but this all, is, and that's the default but, but behavior. But all that aside, let's let's keep it simple. To string is a method call that exists that functions in a very particular way. Polymorphism to change, so we want to be able to call this method, but have it do something but have else. it do something different, yeah. so that it so that we have morphed it into something new, and so he's overriding here to string, and we're providing. A new functionality for it. So, would you say that polymorphism is the ability to redefine the functionality of an existing method or, or yeah. an existing class? Yeah, and we can we can also take advantage of the functionality that was already there as well. This okay. is, and I know this is, it's getting getting into inheritance, and I know why that right. Nelson was trying to explain polymorphism without touching outside inheritance. Of, outside of and inheritance. And I'm sorry for dragging you into it, Nelson. But you really, in, in any object-oriented programming book that you pick up, and you get into um, polymorphism, mm -hmm. this is what it's going to talk about. Mm -hmm. It's going to talk about how a method call can have completely different functionality defined between two classes that both extend a base class that has functionality. So you could have a default functionality. Sure. You could have different functionality if it's this extended version of that class or yet different functionality Now, when along you're, with its old functionality. When you're defining the functionality of that class, do you actually have to specify what overrides are available? What over? So, uh, do you if mean, somebody was to call mean, on, that, uh, on that particular method or... Oh, you're saying if they want to get... Let's, like, say, let's say you're writing your own thing that needs to exhibit polymorphism in some way. Do you have to dis define what those overrides are? I mean, I noticed when he's typing overrides, some very specific things are popping up. Yes, because those things, when defined in the base class, in this case object, yeah. have all been marked as virtual. Okay. They could be virtual, they could be abstract, but something that gives the ability to override and provide your own That's what I'm asking. You, you've got to clearly define what is and isn't overridable. Yeah, you, okay. you will. Yeah. Now, you could use the same name. Right. And to check this out, this is like overriding. Mm -hmm. uh, ReSharper, if I recall, gripes about it. Um, but if if Nelson would have just done public string to string and, and not overridden it, you, he's just replacing the method. So now look what the, the complaint is over ReSharper. Um, it's what? Yeah, new keyword. Because it hides. Because it hides mm -hmm. the system's object to string. Okay. I think, I think I've actually, I'm in the process of reading the spec, and I'm pretty... Far in, but I actually don't know what the behavior of this will be. Ugh. I broke my contract. Eh, contracts suck. Oh, no, they don't. No, they don't. You take we, that we back. Spend, we <laughs> spent an entire video. <laughs> they don't. It sucks at the moment because it's getting in your way, and I just can't sit in this chair anymore. It's the third time yeah. this has happened. Yeah, that, that's exactly what um, what I thought it would happen. You see that although you see that the two string it hides 
the the override, which means that whenever we call toString in the context of an object, it'll use the object, object toString, correct. But if you call it in the context a of a person, right. it'll hide it. And that's why resharper is. But and then if we go ahead and add the new keyword, there was a bug that had gotten introduced in the MMO in the spell manager system where I don't remember exactly what it was. I think it could have been cast, but something important was hiding out. Mm -hmm. um, no, it wasn't cast. What the heck was it? Oh, but it was hiding something in a spell from a, a concrete spell from a base spell, uh -huh. an inheritance. It was hiding it out, and oh my god, the amount of trouble that caused because. It looked like everything was working right, but when it came time for calculating damage, it would get confused as in who the sender was and who the receiver of, of this damage and the spell was. can't remember exactly what, but I, I just know that that's one mistake you don't want to make. If, if you have the ability to, to override, then override it. Yeah. Now, Nelson can still take advantage of the functionality on toString if you want to show him that. So let's say you want it to provide this new bit of information and utilize what was there on object as well. Yeah, so this is... Oh, look at that, AKA, I like that. Ah! Your sharper fails me. It should have placed my cursor over here. You're just not jacked in, man. Notice how he's calling base to string? Mm -hmm. So now watch what happens. Gotcha. So by calling base the base to string, functionality. you're using yeah that functionality. Of uh -huh. And in this, generally speaking, base would be implied. No, uh -huh. um, I have no idea. Probably not. Oh, really? No, it's gonna be it's gonna be an infinite loop. <laughs> da -da -da. It's cool. I've never tried that. I would just have assumed that. Yeah, I, I just really, yeah. Oh, I it, see, so. I see, because you're already calling it as an override. Yeah, okay. so you're just calling it now as a method here. and it's Yeah, just... uh, okay, no, I'm sorry. I, I actually lost track of where we were in the code. I was jotting down a note, so that's that's actually my bad. But cool, we got to try something you've never done before. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But sorry, Nelson, I just figured this would be better than you writing out an inheritance example. Because so... It's available. Two yeah. strings available on everybody. Right. Well, what's uh, we we mentioned virtual a minute ago. What's the purpose of virtual? In case you want somebody who is going to extend your class mm -hmm. to to be able to you, override you that method. Yeah, you provide yeah. a default functionality. Yeah. But perhaps you're going to extend it, and you want to just perhaps. Um, yeah, but and you want to override it and come up with your own functionality. Well, let me ask you this then: um, if if it's being overridden. To what degree do you have control over the override? I mean, do you need to also define various other forms of the override? Like, okay, so I've got random method X, which can take in two arguments and return a third. Or it can, it can return a result from those two. Then um, do I need to also define one where it takes in three arguments and define another one where it takes in four, and then those are ones people can select? Whoa, now you're getting into overloading. So that's, okay. that's yes. something different. All right. Um, just keeping so with, so with with virtual, you're just kind of leaving it open for somebody to redefine yeah, it on their you're own. You're saying this is virtual, and you may not I even provide. Oh, I, I think I know what Zach's asking. Okay. Um, do you mean can you override the method arguments? Like, if you want your base class to take in like three arguments instead of yeah. two, or not your well, base that, class? Well, that's part of it. That's part of it. I think that is part of it. So you can go ahead and answer that question first. No. Okay, good enough. Uh, no, what I was actually getting at was, you know, are, when you specify that a class can be overridden. Uh, uh, behavior uh, within uh, the class. Okay, method. thank you. The, mm -hmm. the, the functionality of a class can be no, overridden. No, the functionality of a method. Sorry, I'm just... Uh, it's fine, as long as yeah. I get the, the, the crap straight. Uh, so as, as, when you can specify that a method can be overridden, okay. you don't have to specify, like, a, an alternate form of it. No, because you're you're, you're locked letting to that. you're letting whoever you're locked to that signature. Okay. So in two string, notice how he didn't go in there and add some parameters. I, what and... I think actually, you're when you said it, it kind of it rang a certain bell. I think it's because I've seen overloading before. See, watch what he's doing here. This is great. He, boom, got an error. There's yeah. no suitable method for that override. There's okay. nothing that matches it. It has the signature has to match. Okay, I th I think at some point in my. Uh, 
uh, in my experiences, I've run into overloading before, and I was getting that confused with okay. overriding. Overlo overloading is okay. just like providing different um, number different, of parameters or, or attribute um, um, arguments, arguments or different return types. Okay. Nope. <laughs> Hang in there, Nelson. Hang in there, man. It's later here. So, so yeah, that's – now, real quick to finish up what I was saying. So with a base class, provides a virtual method that could have a base functionality mm -hmm. implemented, or it may simply be empty. But being virtual, you're not required to implement anything. You don't have to implement your own overridden method in an extending class. Right. Now, there's also abstract classes where you can create abstract methods and you have to override those, but those are required. It's going to start okay, to Okay, hang on a, a second. Contract. Hang on a second. I'm going to make you step back. Define for me a virtual method. Um, a, a method that can be overridden. Can be overridden. That's yeah. what I thought. Okay. By an extended So class. we're cool with that. So define for me an abstract. An, an abstract class... Is 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 like a base class that can't be extended. It can have some functionality in it, and it can be, and it can also contain abstract members, like an abstract method, mm -hmm. which means a method that has its signature defined, but no implementation. Okay. But the interesting thing about it is, unlike virtual, which which is optional if you want to override it. Mm -hmm. If you're extending from an abstract class, you have you to are required. To it's like a contract, just yeah. like with an interface. You have to have all of the same functionality that so was defined. Well, okay, no, I'm sorry, not functionality, just the signature that was defined, yeah. because you wouldn't have any functionality. Where Nelson blank. Nelson hates to use um, inheritance. I hate myself for doing that, this, but I'm doing it for just for you. Fine. There are there are times. Hang Give on me just second. a second. I'm talking to Jason and <laughs> I'm taking notes at the same time. But so what's going on on the screen for, is for for, for me. me. There are times where inheritance is a better solution because I would have to redo the exact same code. Mm -hmm. If there's a bunch of classes, the exact same code is going to have to be redone in, even if it's just a few lines of code. Instead of using an interface, I like abstract classes because in the abstract classes, the code that the, the particular methods that have functionality defined that will be the same across everybody you can just put that in place. Now, hang on a second. I, I, I don't think you've. I'm sure you haven't contradicted yourself, but my brain picked it up that way. Okay. Uh, when you try, when you define for me an abstract class, it started off as a class that cannot be extended. No, cannot be instantiated. Instantiated. Okay. I could have sworn I heard if the word I said extended. extended I'm, if I said extended, I apologize. <laughs> okay. That's the whole point of an abstract class. It can't be instanced. Okay. Okay. Which well, makes I, sense I, I, because I, I, it has I, I, no functionality. Why would you ever in, uh, instantiate a class that has uh, no functionality? Be careful. Abstract classes can have functionality. Okay. In other methods, not an abstract method. I'll show, th show that in a second, but I, I do want to jump in. Yeah, no, go ahead. It's, this is Nelson's corner, not uh, Yeah, Buzz's sorry. Corner. No, it's sorry. fine. <laughs> uh, but I'll, I'll take information wherever I can get it from. So. Okay. Here's a class. Here's a case in uh, – just ignore all this code. Um, for now, mm -hmm. here's a case in uh, ASP.NET MVC where they use an abstract, um, where they use a virtual method mm -hmm. for their controller factory. So they have this magical thing called a controller factory that creates controllers. But sometimes you want to create controllers in other ways. So the controller factory looks like this, the base one. And this is also the default one. It looks like this. It says, I, don't, I can't remember what the signatures are, but... Um, I'm just going to do that. And then it's going to say... I don't know. I'm just going to do that for just for now. And then it's going to say another one. It's going to have a protected virtual object create controller instance from type I can't remember what the actual name was that will by default return activator dot create instance type okay 
So I've actually looked in the ASP.NET MVC source code, and when I say do a ton of stuff, I really mean do a ton of stuff. Like if all you want to do is change the behavior of this controller factory of how exactly it creates the instance of the mm -hmm. object, you without this virtual method, you would have to go in and, well, you would have to re-implement all of this do a ton of stuff, which is I, I think like a few hundred lines of code. Okay. But instead, right now, we can say we can do this protected override on this, and we can do our own stuff here. And there, there's a bunch of different, I mean, yeah, we can create our controller however we want. We can create a controller object. The names don't matter at this point. I'm just showing you uh, kind of how you would override this one small part. However, I don't like this. I think, I personally think, that a better way to do this would be to do this. Can I play the role of you? You can, because I'm not seeing why this is better. Uh, uh, well, he can get to that in a second, but okay. um, your first thing should have been, but Nelson, I was just trying to figure out what an abstract class was for my notes here. and I, I figured he was getting <laughs> oh. to that, but he hadn't made it to it yet, and I'm a very no, patient he's, person. He's, he's not getting to abstract. He's just saying, you know. Did, did he leave it behind again? He, he came out with a shotgun, and he's like, again. Here is why I don't like inheritance, and this uh, is why I prefer interfaces. Yeah, we know you don't like inheritance, <laughs> and we know you you prefer interfaces. That's like old news. We do we we came and went on that. I, I just want to say this is how I would construct this part of the the framework. But go and explain to Zach. Go exactly. and answer Zach's question. Why why do you prefer this? Why is this better? I prefer this because it clearly states this i i controller type creator. And what mm -hmm. it does, he has an interface. Mm -hmm. You can reuse this as much as you want. You don't have to create a new class. Right. And the only thing that changes is the instantiation of base controller factory, because you would just switch out which controller type creator you want. In addition, you don't have all this, this murky uh, luggage coming with you, like this create controller mm -hmm. object. This create controller object is going to exist on your subclass, whether you like it or mm -hmm. not. Even though the only imp the only detail we're really interested in switching up here is just this one line of code. That's it. Yeah. So it doesn't make sense to to have to inherit from this huge class to express this one line of code and how it changes. And I just I just feel it's just so. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I there are concrete reasons why I prefer this method, but they're really hard to. Uh, to articulate right That's now. Fine. Let's go back to an abstract <laughs> class. Do you have anything? To, do you have anything to help me with, Jason? Come on. No, I'm, I, 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 it's, well, it sounds like personal preference. Yeah, I don't. I. It's. It's. I don't it's not. It's, you can't ask somebody to help you articulate your personal preferences. That that kind of that steps outside the bounds if, of personal. If everybody preference. doesn't mind, just to to bring some focus back in, since we were talking about polymorphism. Okay. Hey, hey. <laughs> what is an abstract okay. class? Can Can we go back to that? <laughs> Okay, yes, an abstract class. Okay, so you see, do you understand this example, Zach? I haven't really oh, yeah. had enough ch of a time to, to look at this example yet, but... I'm because he got really sick to his stomach when he was inheriting from animal? Yeah, <laughs> had to, okay. He had, he had to scroll away from it real quick. Yeah, had to, he had to remind you, he was awesome, and here was why. <laughs> I, and I totally understand. I never questioned it for a minute. <laughs> um, yeah, I see what we're doing. We're constantly inheriting from animal to define a bunch of other animals that all can apparently talk. So, so if we instantiate a yep. dog, what's going to happen if you tell the, if you call dog dot talk? Uh, we're gonna it's going to say I'm a talking dog. Okay, and if we instantiate a a cat, how do you spell cat? 
close enough. Close enough? Okay. Well, that's like Kit Kat. It's like the candy bar. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had a coworker a long time ago named. Yeah, that, that'd be the short for <laughs> yeah, that'd be the short for Catherine <laughs> or something. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was awesome, <laughs> Katie. But let's say um, let's let's say that we instantiate cat. Uh-huh. If we invoke the cat's talk, what's it going to say? Nothing right now. Ooh. It will say something. Inheritance. Cat inherits. So it's just going to say, animal. I'm a talking animal? Because we're not overriding it? Very good. Yeah. That's absolutely. Yeah. And that's what I was talking about how with virtual, yeah. you can provide an implementation. Or not. Or not. That yeah. can be overridden or. And that's, not. that's what I was missing. I wasn't actually looking for the word override in, uh, in the dog class. And now that I see it, it's like, oh, well, duh, we're overriding the existing I'm a talking animal bit into I'm a talking dog. We didn't do that with cat, so it's just going to say I'm a but talking animal. But we can animal. also, here's the problem with this design. If I instantiate an animal, mm-hmm. what have I just created? I have no idea. Just Yeah, neither has the system. Of... I've just made an animal. Yeah. But this anim- <laughs> a monstrosity. Ah, now what, what Nelson's doing is, is, there you go, much, much better. Because, because now, now this means we can't instantiate an animal. Exactly. We can only extend it and instantiate one of its extensions. Exactly. All right. And then when we give it this, when we uh, make this class abstract, we can now introduce abstract methods. So let's say we decide that we no longer want to provide a default implementation for talk. Yeah. Now we're going to get, re- remove the method body and change virtual to abstract. And the only thing that's going to change. Hang on, let, is let me this. try this. Let me let me try to guess at what it means. It it means that we can't call on that functionality directly. We've got to override it, mm. or we've we've got to to define what it does. You're. Okay. Uh, I Can feel I like I'm. Yeah. Go ahead. Hang that's on, fine. No. I, I, it's a, I, I feel like Nelson now. Yes and no. That's fine. That's fine. When you say we can't call on that directly, well, we we can't even instantiate animal. So we can't call a direct animal's talk. So either. if okay, then let me let me try to rephrase based okay. on that. If okay. we extend animal, mm-hmm. then we have to provide some Ooh. sort of functionality for talk. Awesome! And you can see that Resharper right now is telling Nelson that he needs to turn in his programmer's card because he failed. See the see the red uh-huh. line on fifty two. Yeah, Go because, ahead, move your mouse over that. Because you Thank haven't you. implemented. It's not implemented. Okay, gotcha. So where with virtual. It was optional. It was optional. Here it's a must. Here it's a must. Okay. And the difference, with, though, was with virtual, you actually had some functionality in there. And with, yes. with abstract, you have none. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Awesome. But still, if you ever find yourself doing this pattern, always consider this. <laughs> He's like the used car salesman. I know. Awesome. I know. Yes, Are you well, sure you wouldn't be much happier I mean, with this? This one's okay. Yeah. It's a clunker. It's exactly. really messy. Exactly. Don't you want to get in something sleek and sexy like this? Uh-huh. And then as you drive off in your clunker, he's like, now don't remember, don't forget, we've got sleek and sexy over here. I'm still thinking the dude from True Lies. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Bill Paxton? Uh, Bill Paxton, that's right, that's right. <laughs> awesome. We're talking one thing. <laughs> okay, for our viewers, because we're going to be wrapping up here in a minute since we're probably killing Zach with information overload. This has been a lot. I'm glad I was taking notes. It's, it's, Zach was concerned earlier. Uh, you voiced yourself uh, to, to Nelson and I not long after we started about, you know, are we just rehashing stuff? Yeah. And, and I said no. Actually, and, well, what happened was I quietly slipped Jason a no, note. No, you actually said it before. Did I? And, yeah, okay. And, Did I also say it too? And then, no, then the note he slipped me was, I know I'm wasting everyone's time. Yeah. <laughs> and I told Zach no because at that time, Nelson actually had split things up, and I saw where he was going. Mm-hmm. And I think that's very important to talk about uh, in, in the beginning stages of, of learning design with software. Yeah. Because uh, tomorrow we will get into design patterns. And design patterns are going to utilize, I mean, obviously, if we're going to be using classes, we're going to be using um, interfaces. Mm-hmm. There, there, there's all sorts of things. We're going to use everything that you've seen. Um, Nelson, if you want to add to that. No, no, that's true. I mean, I, I didn't really, I wasn't intending this to be. I like a a beginner definition of of all of these different things, like what you'd see in a textbook, because I always thought that was useless. See, the thing that I, I never really read in any introductory object oriented, you know, any any intro to classes chapter in your standard introduction to C sharp book, is the principles behind it, the theory behind it. And that's kind of what I tried to express, but <laughs> I think I failed. Sort no, of, you, but you you were really some, getting. I think you were doing a great job when you started splitting out. A class that had multiple um, multiple specific functionalities 
within it into separate classes and then getting into interfaces and, and demonstrating how we can write functionality that will take in a type, but the type is based off of an interface so that we have the flexibility of sending multiple types into that and, and it being properly handled. I mean, and that, that is something that will become important in a lot of the different patterns that we're going to be using. At least I think. So I think all of this stuff was very important to go over because at the end of the day, Nelson, the, the goal that you and I talked about at the very beginning is I really wanted Zach to learn from this stuff. And he really needs to have an understanding of everything that was talked about tonight. Don't you think so? Right. Yeah. All right. Uh, so... Except for how to spell. Here's a quick thing. Well, you know, uh, some causes are hopeless. We have to kind of <laughs> go with that. Uh, now, an abstract method, can that only be in an abstract class? Yes. Okay. If I were to uh, remove this abstract, we would get yeah. there. Okay. I mean, I just, I'm saying, like, you couldn't go into any other class and drop in an abstract method. No. Okay. It would that's have to be an abstract kind of what class. he demonstrated there by taking out abstract. It made animal. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I was just thinking in the different, in the opposite oh, direction. That's, yeah, I was just trying to get you to see what he did. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Your not questions off the top of my head. Not, great not, not without pouring back over my notes, which, of course, I'm happy to do. You've got a lot uh, of notes. Actually, to, to review what I've jotted down here, we started off with basic stuff that I'm sure most folks who are watching this already know. And, and to be try to be fair to myself, I, I've been exposed to all this stuff a lot, and I'm sure at any uh, there are probably several different points where you could have walked around and said, hey, define class, and I'd have been like right on the ball because I only discussed it two nights ago. But then big long swaths of time pass where all I'm doing is playing with Maya or ZBrush or Photoshop or I'm writing articles or, or doing something, and you just don't touch this stuff. And so sure. the distinct terminology starts to kind of stale a little bit. But uh, So we talked about the definition of classes. Uh, we went into uh, states, which are... I, 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 Property values, essentially. Uh, that, I mean, that's what I pulled from it. Is they, they boil down more or less to uh, a snapshot in time of all of the um, of all of the property values of a given class. Mm, property values, no. Okay. The state is uh, all of the values of the of the class, not properties. Properties are about exposing state to the external okay. world, but not every not every piece of state is always going to be exposed. See, for example, in the case of this uh, random dude down here somewhere. Uh, did I delete him? You probably did, oh, yeah, dude, because you went like crazy with delete a while ago. <laughs> you saw that he had two uh, private fields, the random so and the uh, okay, people. Okay, yeah. Th that was the state of him. Even though he didn't expose any properties, he still had state. Right. And I, sh I should be a lot clearer when I speak, because I, I use the term property probably a little more generically with than I should. I, I knew which comes meant. all the way I, back to a topic we have addressed several times in this video, which is you just can't speak English when you're programming. It's all of, the, all of your fields. All of your fields. Would it include the properties at all? Or is it just fields only? Because, well, I mean, I realize they're two different things. Do you want to see, see a magic trick? Well, I always want to see a magic trick. Ta da! Uh, <laughs> Sounds like yes, so. So now they're fields. Well, no, no, they already yeah. were. The, uh, the, the, what, the syntax that was there before is just shorthand. Alrighty, place. alrighty, fine. Yeah, just using the, the get and set. Okay, so. That's can, the compiler. So, yeah, that's shorthand. Can I say then that the state is the culmination of the field values of a, of a class? Yeah. Okay. That's fine. And just, like I said, I'm just looking for something that I can actually put in writing in my notes. <laughs> and hopefully people who are following along are also taking these notes because I think it'll save us all some time. Uh, so let's see. Then from there, we took a look at behavior. That's just the things that a class can do. Let's just keep it simple like that. An interface, it describes a contract uh, that a programmer who's utilizing a class must adhere to this contract. Uh, as a convention, it's usually named starting with an I. It, uh, it can contain events, properties, and methods. Nothing else you want to add or detract or say, hey, you should also be aware of this, or am I good to, to go on? No, that's exactly okay, what it does. Okay. Um, we, did, we did talk briefly about just inheritance as it pertains to C Sharp and that you can only inherit from one class, but you can implement many interfaces if you so desire. Uh, we brought up the single responsibility principle, or SRP, the idea that a class should only be responsible for dealing with one responsibility and one only. Yes. Okay. Except for uh, that line... Can, that line's very blurry. And that's I understand that, and we actually kind of ran into that, where we had a class that you could argue was two, doing two different things, but the, the second thing required the first thing, so it, it kind of had to get lumped together. 
Yeah. All right. Uh, we talked about the data transmission object, or the DTO. This is a dummy object that just carries around values so that I suppose other classes... It carries around state. Yeah, it carries around the state so that it can be queried, I suppose, called upon, so other people can ask it what its state is. Yeah. Uh, decoupling, which is making classes no longer dependent on one another. Um, let's see. Uh, then we talked briefly about the difference between delegates and functionality, which turned into a great conversation, by the way. Uh, but delegates are about swapping out functionality based on a contract where interfaces are about identifying the exactly what kind of object you're working with at a given time. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good summary. Uh, inheritance is the ability to extend a generic definition into something more ex uh, more specific, uh, or it doesn't have it to doesn't be, have more, to be more specific. It can also be an alternate form of what was already there. Through yes. polymorphism. Through polymorphism, which is the ability to redefine the functionality of an existing method. Talked about yes. composition, which is the fields and properties that require instances of other classes. I hope that one's right, because that was one that I was a little bit cloudy on, and that's what I jotted down. Say it one more time. It is uh, fields and properties that require instances of other classes, as opposed to just direct data types. Well, yes. That's, that's no. what I pulled from <laughs> what you said. Oh, no, no, no. I think you, I think you have the idea. It just worded a bit funny. Oh, that's still um, in my life. <laughs> it, yeah, it's it, there are fields that are of ty of other types, okay. are of other. Um, we we'll just keep it simple. Uh, it's a complex class. Type complex class. Okay, and I'll I'm made of. I'll just uh, swap out other for complex classes. There we go. Okay, uh, virtual methods. A method that can be overwritten, but that overriding is optional and not required. An abstract class is a class that cannot be instantiated, has a signature defined. Uh, defined, excuse me, but no implementation. If you extend it, you must implement the signature method yourself. You're, no, oh, okay, you left off the word method to begin with, though. Did I? Yeah, because the, the abstract class doesn't have a signature. It's the methods. You can have abstract methods okay. within. You can't, all right, all right. Then, you know, what I was probably doing was, yeah, I think I was actually jotting down two notes at the same time, and they gotcha. all kind of got jumbled together. Uh, what you guys don't know is I actually sent Jason a secret note during the video saying, hey, we're, we're nearing the end of my absorption skills because the video is, you know, it's, it's kind of long. Uh, <laughs> finally, we got to uh, abstract method, and uh, that is a method that it can only be in an abstract class, and it doesn't contain any functionality in and of itself. Uh, the only way it could be touched upon is if you were extending the abstract class within which that abstract method was sitting, in which case you have to define the functionality of that abstract method. You have method. to implement You have to implement that it. method. That's correct. And that's everything we've covered so far. That's everything I have. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Good enough. So then tomorrow night, um, was there anything else that you could think about, Nelson, that you wanted to cover before we started with the um, – first pattern no I, I think that we can start talking about yeah, stuff too. Um, it's yeah. been quite a bit covered it's been an outstanding video I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of people out there that will really appreciate this all right well anything else either of you want to add I don't have any more questions at the moment Nelson I mean if if, if uh, all no. of these definitions that I just rolled through didn't need any uh, gross corrections of any kind then I apparently I've pulled out everything we talked about awesome all right, well, with that, that is going to wrap up Episode 6 of Nelson's Corner. Nelson, thank you very much for your time tonight. Zach, thank you. And thank you. Nobody killed one another, so that's no. a good thing. So that will conclude this video. Bye, everyone.